uh, Parks Committee for May 27th uh, is now in session. Uh, um, roll call. Uh, oh, I hit the wrong button. Excuse me. Uh, Alder Weary? Uh, here. Alder Burnett? I'm here. Alder Gerlock? Here. And the chair is here. All are pr present. Uh, I'll take a motion to approve our uh, agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Alder Gerlach, seconded by Alder Burnett. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We have an agenda. Can I just keep rolling? We're good? Okay. Uh, I'll take a motion to uh, approve our minutes from our last meeting. Motion to approve. Motion Second. to approve by Alder Weary. Seconded Second. by Alder Gerlach. Mm -hmm. uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. On to regular business. Okay. Uh, number one, consideration with possible action on the presentation of a master plan for the Bear Creek Parkway along Baston Street. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the lead on that. So last fall, the park committee directed staff to create a master plan for this parkland. Uh, it's in the Baird Creek Greenway, just east of Dan's Avenue, right along Baston Street. So in the agenda packet, I did include uh, a copy of the proposed master plan of what that area could consist of. Uh, currently, all that really is in that location is there is a small tot playground, which you can see on the existing master plan. And then there's an engineered stormwater wetland that Public Works constructed a few years back. Uh, staff did meet with Alderman Stevens uh, to discuss the, and then we developed this concept based on the comments that he received. So, I'm gonna have uh, Corey Mim, uh, she is our park planner. I'm gonna have her jump in and just give a real brief presentation of the elements of this master plan. Hey, hi everybody. Um, so yeah, like Dan mentioned, we do have some existing elements in the park. It's also an existing soccer field here that is being utilized. Um, so we thought it was best to leave it, um, not only do we have scheduled games that use that facility, but also pick up games in the neighborhood? So we felt it was important to leave that. Um, then if you look up kind of at the corner of Dan's Avenue and Baston Street, um, that area is mainly just kind of utility and turf grass right now. So we felt that adding a pollinator garden and perhaps some um, art to the utilities could help um, the appearance there, since it seems to be such a busy area, we thought it might be a nice um, kind of entrance as you're driving by. Um, but then as you move further to Baston Street and really towards the middle of the park area, we felt that that would be a good area for like the main entrance into the park where we would be inviting users through that space, through a pollinator garden and some type of entry arbor. Um, that entrance would then connect you kind of into the park, which could lead to the existing Baird Creek paved trail. Um, the thought was to also have an entrance arbor from the trail to the park so that users would know, you know, that's a nice way to enter into the space. We could potentially put some bench seating or something along that area as well. Um, then if you look on there's kind of the round circular area of circles. So that area is planned to, it's currently basically, for the most part, turf grass. Um, the thinking there is that we would remove that underused, underutilized turf grass and plant 100 trees. Um, and in doing that, we would also be commemorating the 100 year celebration of the Parks Department this year, serving the community. Um, our funding for that and are hoping to get that installed this fall. Um, if you look to the east end of the park, you'll see a dog park. Um, that area is about 21,000 square feet. And if you compare that to the Whitney dog park, 
Um, Whitney is about 17,000 square feet. So this one would be approximately 4,000 square feet larger. In general, um, that's fairly small for a typical dog park. Um, so I guess I just wanted to note that. You'll also see in the dog park area, as well as outside of it, some of the trees that are shown have circles kind of within them. So those trees are ash trees, and the uh -huh. first department is treating those. There's 23 of them, and the plan is to continue to treat them um, to help prolong their life as long as possible. So that's what that's indicating. Um, then we do have, on the very far east side, a proposed shelter location. The thinking was that trail users might want to utilize that space, maybe for a picnic or something. Um, then we looked at an alternative shelter location, kind of to the west of the tree planting. Um, and the thinking is, if we put it there, that might be more utilized by spectators of the soccer and playground areas. Um, so the thinking with the playground is that when it's time to be replaced, that it would be relocated further away from the dog park, just, I guess, for safety concerns, um, as well as, again, for folks who are kind of over in the soccer area spectating there might want to utilize that equipment as well. Um, the existing playground equipment was installed in 2002, so it's not planned to be, um, as far as our rotational um, equipment replacement, about 15 years. So if there was a desire to move it sooner, we could take a look at whether existing equipment, but I think really it might just make the most sense since that dog park area is fenced there should be plenty of safety between users and the park um, that we just move it, you know, when the time comes to replace. So I guess that's overall, oh, and I don't know if I, if I mentioned the pollinator gardens, but we thought that too could just be kind of a nice visual as well as, again, we raise turf and stuff into the space. So yeah, that's pretty much all. Are there any questions? Well, just one follow-up thing here. Uh, so as far as funding goes to implement this, the only funding that we currently have right now is at last month's RDA, Redevelopment Authority meeting, uh, they allocated $30,000 to go towards this site. Uh, 15,000 of that will go to uh, purchase trees for the 100-year tree uh, planting and then they would also like to put in a sculpture in the park also. Uh, so they allocated some some, uh, through their uh, funding sources through the community development block grant program and those things will be done yet this year uh, prior to November because we do have to spend that money this year uh, all of the other items that core items and so what we would look at doing is we would look at uh, our five-year CIP plan uh, starting in 2021 and see where these developments would fit within that plan uh, so we don't have any uh, idea at this point which year makes the most sense to fund this based on our other priorities, uh, but we'll be exploring that later on this fall and the 2021 bond request is hopefully going to be brought forward this fall. Any so really all that I'm looking for is just um, a motion to approve the master plan. So that's what we're trying to do. It gives some validity to when we start uh, discussing the finances for this. Anyone questions, comments, anything? Or I'll take a motion. I would just like to ask one question, please, Mr. Chairman. Alder Gerlach. I just want to, um, I think that um, Alder Stevens is on the call, and I just want to hear from him that he, that this is, you know, that he feels good that this is what the neighborhood wants and the he's happy with that. Yes, yeah, so I would have to agree with the last couple of months I've been working on this and talking with neighbors in the other section, and they're looking for that dog park on the east side. And we going through this whole situation with parks, it was determined that 100 year trees would be great, dog park. So the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing with this master plan. Thank you. So you wanted the plan to go to the dogs? <laughs> well, from the get go, we knew we all kind of do this in the first year. So it's a couple years yeah. in the making going on. 
Anyone else? Motion to approve. Motion to approve the master plan by Alder Weary. Burnett, actually. Burnett. I'm sorry. Stop. I'll second it up. Okay. <laughs> A uh, motion by Alder Burnett, thank you, and uh, seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Move on to the next item. Okay, uh, item number two, consideration with possible action on the research by staff to explore land acquisition options for the creation of a park to serve the residents on the southern end of District 9, on or near the Liberty Street and 12th Avenue corridors, staff. And so this topic was discussed at the March 25th Park Committee, and a motion was made to re refer this to staff to do just a little more research uh, on this request by Alderman Johnson. Uh, so at the time, uh, a property near Liberty Street and 12th Avenue was considered a problem house. Uh, so we were asked to look into what it would cost to purchase a house in the neighborhood and convert it to a park uh, so that sex offenders uh, couldn't be placed in that house uh, again. So we researched this in more detail and we determined that by the, the law, uh, an offender couldn't live within 1,500 feet of a school, church, child care facility, or park. We had a map in the agenda packet highlighting where the the property in question is located. And then we have highlighted where the adjacent um, facilities, uh, those type of facilities are located uh, near that, that property. Uh, and then we created a 1500 foot radius around each of those. Uh, uh, that there's a, a kind of a void uh, in the city limits uh, and that void would be south of Liberty Street and north of Tony Cannadale Run. Uh, and then it would be to the west 14th Avenue and the east Broadway Street. So if we were to consider installing a new park uh, in this general vicinity, what this map shows is that basically we should be focusing our efforts um, on the property, south of the property, not north. Um, so ideally you would pick a, a location right in the middle of the void, uh, which would be somewhere close to the 11th Street and Lombardi Avenue area. Uh, that would provide the most coverage for the neighborhood if that's something the city council uh, would, would wish to pursue and more um, uh, would like to pursue further. So right now it's difficult to put together an estimate for the cost of this project because we don't know uh, which property we would be purchasing. Uh, we don't know what the acquisition price would be because it's all dependent on which property you acquire. Uh, but I will tell you that I would assume that the cost to build a park after the property acquisition would be approximately $75,000. Uh, so what that price would entail would be the cost to remo remove whatever building is on the property uh, to demolish it and then install some landscaping, benches, uh, walkways, some lighting, and maybe a sculpture uh, to create more of a sculptural park instead of an actual playground park. But we could also install a playground, it's just that would cost a little bit more money to develop the park. Um, so at this point, this is the information that we put together. Um, and I guess I would be looking for more direction from the park committee and city council as far as what you would like us to do with this information uh, now that we've provided it. Chair? Yes. If I could, uh, thank okay. you, Dan. I apologize. I missed the first half of your presentation. Zoom kicked me out here. Oh, um, I apologize. I, I caught the tail end, which was probably the more important piece. And, and thank you for doing this map. This is exactly what we were looking for to get started. I think as uh, I continue to have conversations with other partners on this particular project, I'm more than comfortable if the committee uh, is willing to simply hold this item uh, while we continue to have additional conversations with. Uh, the law department and some other staff about options, uh, but this was a very necessary step for us to be able to carry those conversations into that next level. So again, if the committee is okay holding it, uh, that, that would be my preferred 
course of action, and then I'll continue to do that additional work and we can bring it back when it's ready. Should we table it for yeah, that, months or? I, I, I'd be comfortable tabling it and we'll just remove it from the table when it's ready. Okay, do, do we, when we table something, no, I think we need a date on it, don't we, or am I? Or a motion to remove it from, a, from the table, which can occur at a, at a subsequent meeting. Okay. okay. Well, then I would take a motion to table this. Was that a second? Burnett. Motion by Weary. Alder Burnett, second it by Alder Weary. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that is tabled. Uh, are we ready for three? We are ready for three. You are quick, James. Consideration with possible action on the request by Alder Lafave and Alder Weary that due to high water levels and recurring flooding along the Bay of Green Bay, mm -hmm. that the city reconsider plan for a sand swimming beach and bathhouse at the Bay Beach Amusement Park. Uh, I don't know if we want to start with the alders that put in this communication or staff. I, uh, why don't we go to the alder? Uh, what are you thinking here? Alder Weary, Alder, is Alder Lafayette? Yep, oh. I was just seeing if Alder Lafayette was on and I don't see I don't her. See her. No. <clears throat> and, and this was uh, originally Alder Lafayette's uh, request. Uh, uh, I did it to sign on to it um, to get it on the table to look at because I think we've seen the last few years that in okay. there's been the model would be destroyed every year. And so. I think it'd be good to hear from from staff their their thoughts on this. Okay. Uh, well, let's kick it to staff. Yeah, I'll just kind of give you a, a brief summary of where we sit because we really haven't talked about this project in a while, uh, and you know a few things have been tweaked and modified as we go along. So, in 2018, the city approved going ahead with the construction of the pier, sand beach, shoreline walkway bathhouse with concession stand and additional paved parking. Uh, at the time, the uh, uh, anticipated budget was $7 to do all of that work. And the proposed funding sources were $1 million in grant funding, $1 million in fundraising dollars, and then $5 million in city bonding. And in 2018, the city did bond $5 million towards this project. So the revenues from Bay Beach uh, will pay for the annual bond payments and, and we do bring in more than enough revenue to cover those annual payments. So for this uh, bond payment, uh, the taxpayers were not responsible to, be, to pay any of those payments. So that's, that's important to know for those of you who weren't involved with the initial discussion. Uh, since that time, uh, we have begun securing Grand Mayor Jim Schmidt did begin a fundraising campaign. Uh, to date, we have secured 425000 out of the $1 million fundraising goal. And uh, Jim Schmidt uh, received commitments to date of approximately 723000 out of the $1 million goal. So that currently leaves us with a shortfall of about $825,000 out of the $7 million budget. Um, the current financing option has the city paying off the bond request to through 2038. Uh, so starting in 2024, uh, Bay Beach will be paying approximately $430,000 per year uh, for this bond payment. And that includes our annual interest payments on top of the, the principal payments. So recently, uh, we have been having discussions with the finance director to see if there's an opportunity to phase this project a little bit differently to allow us to refinance the bond payment uh, so that we can pay it off early. And what that would do is it would save us a considerable amount of money uh, in interest payments over the years. So by rethinking the financing and phasing, we are able to pay off the bond early and still complete all of the desired improvements without any additional cost to the taxpayers. Uh, so by refinancing in 2026, uh, we could potentially save uh, over a million dollars or nearly a million dollars in interest payments uh, throughout the years if we're able to refinance it and pay it off early. So currently, because we have a shortage of funding uh, due to 
that we haven't met our fundraising goals or our grant goal. Uh, and the project expenses haven't gone down any because this is two years later since we originally bonded for it. We're now looking at a phasing plan for this project and we'll build as much as we can with the funding that we have. So our current game plan is to bid out the beach, boardwalk, bathhouse with concession stand, additional parking and stormwater management in the near future. So the construction plans and specifications are nearly completed. I'd say they're over 95% completed. And our current plans right now are to begin construction later this fall and have all of these improvements completed by the start of our 2021 Bay Beach season. So the project wouldn't be completed this fall. It wouldn't be completed until the spring or early summer. Uh, what we're proposing to phase uh, a little bit differently uh, would be the pier. Uh, so the pier is the highest uh, cost of the entire project. <laughs> and what we're proposing to do is not to eliminate the pier, but to temporarily put it on hold. So we'll put all of the other items out for bid. We'll see what the prices come in at. We'll see how much money is left. We'll look at refinancing in 2026. And then we will use revenues from Bay Beach uh, to fund the pier, and as soon as we have the money to do all of that, that's when we'll actually install the pier. So we, the pier would be on hold temporarily for a few years while we go through that process and secure additional revenue dollars through our Bay Beach account. Uh, but again, in this scenario, we would not be looking to the taxpayers to fund anything, and we definitely would not want to bond any more money to fund for the pier construction. So that's kind of where we're at right now with our timeline and our phasing and what we're looking at doing for um, um, phasing and construction and refinancing. So I don't know if anyone has any specific questions for me as it relates to the high water. Uh, I just wanted to fill everybody in because we haven't talked in quite a while about finances for this project and where we sit with phasing. I know that a lot of questions have come up and people have been wondering uh, why it hasn't been constructed yet. Um, you know, it was temporarily put on hold because our, we were waiting for our consultant to finish up the bid documents and we wanted to take another look at this, uh, at this um, uh, restructuring of the finances. So again, it, it's not, it's just, wasn't it was just pushed back a little bit it wasn't necessarily even put on hold it was just pushed back waiting for the construction documents and figuring out a phasing plan because we didn't have enough money to to move ahead with the entire project well does flooding affect the beach at all i mean i didn't really think i mean i, I know like florida beaches get pounded every year with hurricanes and they still got beaches Do we really have to worry about flooding uh, eroding the beach well, I will tell you that this is a dynamic beach system. Uh, so the water levels go up, they go down. Sometimes it goes up quite a bit on a daily basis. You know, in a storm event, it can raise 12 inches, no problem, even higher than that in a 24 hour period. And it can go down that quickly too. Uh, so I will tell you that our consultant engineered the beach uh, to accommodate uh, the fluctuation in water uh, coming up and down in normal events. Now in storm events, um, yeah, we will have times when the sand is pulled out uh, of the area and it'll go out into the bay. Uh, but when those storm events uh, go away, our consultant is telling us that the sand will come back and redeposit onto the beach. Um, I will also tell you that over the year, due to uh, the high water over the past year or two, uh, excuse me. We did have three storm events that I will tell you probably would have done some damage to the beach project. What the extent of the damage would have been, it's hard for me to tell. Uh, because when you add the sand to the beach, uh, we are changing the wave action. And basically, we'll be dispersing the waves somewhat before they even get to the shoreline because we're adding so much sand into the bay. But, you know, they were pretty big storm events. I'm not going to lie. And, you know, right now those storm events were crashing over the um, existing uh, dike that's out there. And they were, the waves were, I would say, two to three feet above the dike. Uh, so unless we were to raise that dike two to three feet, we would have incurred some damage to the beach had it gone in. 
So, okay, but it it should recover as far as the beach goes. Well, that our consultant is telling us that if the sand gets washed away, uh, it will replenish itself over time. Um, with the high water, uh, the beach was designed with a high water so that we would have uh, about a 50 foot strip of beach in high water condition. So if we were to build the beach right now, we would have about a 50 foot strip of beach. Uh, if we were to wait until normal water levels uh, go back into play, uh, we would have about a 100 to 150 foot wide beach uh, is, is what it was designed to. So like I said, unless we raise that dike three feet, um, we still would have had water crashing over that dike in the storm events that we had. And as far as the pier goes, is uh, the design of the pier, construction of the pier gonna be taking in, uh, these storm events into account? Yeah, so I mean, the pier, the pier is being built uh, to uh, handle storm events and to handle the ice shelves. Um, and it will be, the pier will be built up higher than the dike and the beach area. Anyone else with questions or comments? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alder Weary and then Mr. I, I would like to say also that um, I know that uh, the Friends of Bay, the president of the Friends of Bay Beach is, is on this meeting and he would okay. like to speak also. Yeah. We'll open the floor just soon uh, as Alder Weary. Uh, yep. We have the floor, Alder Weary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, for me, I think the boardwalk and the, uh, the pier are probably the best parts of the project. The beach was never the number one thing, even though it's you know, kind of called the beach project. But uh, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but right now I think the water's high enough that would there even be a beach? Yes, I believe we would still have a beach. I'd have to check what the water level is right now at this point, and I could tell you at, at council meeting how wide of a beach we would have with the current water level conditions. I don't know that offhand, but I think I, uh, we would have some sand. I know the last two storms, I remember walking over there and seeing the area right behind the dike in between the, the building, that, that was basically like a mini lake. It almost yep. looked like it was threatening the building and maybe even the train depot. Um, yeah. And what, what's going on? Raise that? <laughs> what we're doing as part of this project is we're looking at draining that area. That area actually has a pump house. There's a little shed that's out there now. There's a pump house and there's drain tile in the area and it's supposed to drain it. But that drain tile is not functioning anywhere so it has nowhere to pump out. So as part of this project, uh, we are uh, looking at that and our intent is to drain that area much better uh, with a new pump house in and taking the water elsewhere. So that will be rectified in this, in it, if this prod or when this project is built, we will take care of that drainage issue. I, I'd hate for one of these high water events or storms to, you know, to wipe out, you know, the infrastructure, right infrastructure. So mm -hmm. whatever we have to do to increase the boardwalk or dike. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions from the committee. Anyone? I, ha I oh. would like to- Aldo Gerlach? I'd like some clarification from Aldo Weary because I, I don't understand if the concern from what I'm reading, if the concern is that you, you you're talking about flooding um, in general at Bay Beach from what I can gather but I thought that this um, consideration was about, it sounds to me like it was about halting the plans for the sand spring beach and the bathhouse. And I'm just, I, I'm having trouble putting them together. All never weary. Certainly. Well, they're, they're all part of the same project, you know, funding wise. So uh, obviously the main concern in the, in the uh, request was the beach, you know, would we really be able to have a beach and what would these storms and high water do to it? Uh, you know, would it disperse it out into the bay? Would it push it up over the dike onto the grassy area and onto the boardwalk and, and make a mess? Um, it hit spend a lot of time and, and money on something that we're not gonna be able to utilize. So I think it was, it was just because of the recent storms, it was a good time to reassess the project. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else? If not, let's I'll take a motion to open the floor. Motion, motion to open the floor. Motion by Alder Burnett, seconded by Second. Alder Garlack. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the floor is now open. Uh, Mr. Boss, did I say that correctly? It's got the wrong name on there. It's Dave. Oh, it's got the, I was going to say, you didn't look like Michelle, but I didn't know yeah. if it was French somehow. <laughs> well, this my right. assistant. Yeah, uh, if you could state uh, your name and address for the yep. uh, uh, record. David R. Charles, uh, representing Friends of Bay Beach. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've met and discussed this several times amongst ourselves, and uh, we have a number of issues uh, concerning the beach and the bathhouse, uh, and we would request that this be delayed indefinitely uh, because of three basic reasons. The first reason being the promised funding when we set this in motion, it was agreed that the mayor would develop a million dollar funding program. Nothing has been delivered yet. That the parks group and the city would grant about a million dollars in grants. And as you heard, we're less than halfway on the grants program. So those two fundamental financial goals have not been met. The second thing is we are also struggling with the water and the flooding problem. I spoke with Corps of Engineers and they're predicting for July 10th an additional eight inches of water above and beyond where we are now. And when this was originally engineered, I think we're somewhere between 18 and 20 inches above those design levels that we started with. And so it's a very expensive venture. You know, if you got a million bucks worth of beach and a half million dollars worth of bathhouse that may or may not be usable. And there just seems like better ways to spend it. And we've got a delay. We've gone from this beach of 150 feet to 50 feet to maybe nothing. And we just don't think it's a good investment of funds right now to provide services to the community for three or four months out of the year that may not survive the first year. And we don't know where this water will go in the next few years. So that's a significant uh, piece of the puzzle. And uh, we would like to see the continuation of the boardwalk and the other projects that uh, you know we're going ahead with here. So we just are sharing our opinion and, and we just think the beach at this moment uh, is really you know, not a very good investment, nor a, a wise one that we could end up a year from now with very little of it back. And of course, engineers don't guarantee anything. They just share ideas with you. And then if it turns bad, you got a problem. So between the shortage of funds, even this year, our season's going to be short. So the park's ability to generate all this revenue is also going to be a struggle. Any Thank questions you. for Mr. Charles? Of course. Yeah, uh, Alder Gerlach. Would you just tell me the mission of Friends of Bay Beach, please? Uh, the mission of Friends of Bay Beach is to enhance the park for the enjoyment of the community and the youth and everyone that services. So our primary mission is to raise money to help take the beach from the condition it was in three or four years ago. There is a plan in place that showed approximately a $25 million renovation, 20 to $25 million renovation, running over anywhere from five to 12 years, depending on raising availability of cash grants uh, and different things that come to fruition. And so we've been in phase one of that plan. And the first phase of the plan was to raise Bay Beach revenues to generate enough money so that it could invest that profitability into paying for completion of the rest of the plan. Uh, we've raised five and a half million or so. You've seen the Ferris wheel, the new improvements and enhancements, and the revenues on the park have been raised up. At the time we looked at this bonding project that Mayor Schmidt wanted to put in place, we had a really good plan and, and it, mathematically it made some sense to look at it. Subsequently, that $7 million plan has come up short at this moment, a million and a half in fundraising. It's 
everything we've touched from a budget standpoint has gone way over budget. It's been a struggle. We've had to add a few things that we weren't planning on the whole groundwater management thing for the parks, very critical to doing all of that. So that's why all these things are shifting and shaking. And then we take the possibility of this one piece when we're done being of no value. Maybe, I mean, again, I'm not saying it's for sure, but we all can use a lot of logic and yes, we had water coming over the dike and we had a lot of things. I've lived on the bay all my life and the water <laughs> continues to go up. And I, you know, and a Corps of Engineers also uh, says, and Nora, they're both very good sources for water levels coming out of Superior, has indicated significant concerns about continued increasing water levels. So maybe someday if we can build a 150 foot beach and we can build a bathhouse so you can use the beach, it might be a good thing, but putting it in now and risking it going away doesn't seem real smart. So we would just request that it be delayed indefinitely until we have better conditions for building it. Alderdorf? Oh, I guess, no, I guess it's not a question for Mr. Charles. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll wait. I'm okay. sorry. Yep, not fine. Alder Burnett. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Charles, thanks for uh, speaking tonight and thanks for all the work you do at Bay Beach for us, for the city. Are you suggesting that the entire project be put on hold or just the sand portion? I, I was a little confused. The beach and the bathhouse. You don't need a bathhouse if you don't have a beach. Right, right. And so those two components, I think the boardwalk should go ahead and be completed. They may have some issues with walls based on water heights that have to be relooked at. But you know, the end the groundwater has to go ahead, parking has to go ahead. You know, and like Dan said, it's all being phased in if there's funding available. It's just that this one component right now seems to have some potentially bad timing. Sure. Thank you. I, I, I just want to make sure I understand. What and again, it's Dan's project, not ours. This is just an opinion. Mm -hmm. You guys got to, you know, he runs the parks. You guys do that. But if we didn't share our opinion, A, my members wouldn't be happy. And, you know, I wouldn't. So we have to just share that opinion. Well, we're always happy to hear from the friends of Bay Beach. You do a great job. <laughs> I hope so. Yep. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Dan, what do you think? Motion to close the floor. But. Well, uh, well, okay. Motion to close the floor. Second. Well, I was looking. Motion by Holder Gerlach. No, oh, I thought it was. No, I'm, I'm looking for a motion. Okay, I'll move to close the floor. Sure. Yep. Second. 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 Burnett. Second by Alder Burnett. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the floor is now closed. Uh, Dan? Yeah, so, you know, I just wanted to say first and foremost, you know, we appreciate everything the Friends of Bay Beach has done for, for Bay Beach as a whole. They're a great entity. We have a great working relationship. Uh, Dave and Mr. Charles and I have had many conversations about the beach. Uh, so I am, you know, well aware of uh, his opinion on, on the subject. And, you know, I respect his opinion. Uh, we have a, we're not, we don't see quite eye to eye on this one, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have a great working relationship. So I just want you all to know that. Um, and, you know, secondly, if you're looking for my opinion, uh, on how to move forward here, I would still recommend staying the course. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, our plan is to write this, uh, the, the specification. So when it goes out to bid, um, we will be doing the sand one of the last thing so that would give us some time uh to see you know see if the water levels come down but that sand wouldn't be placed in, until likely next year uh closer to the opening of our season so you know we can determine at that time what happens uh with the with the elevation of the water uh that doesn't mean we can't still go ahead with the other items such as the boardwalk the bathhouse with concession stand and else you know other projects like that you know the parking lot expansion the stormwater management all of those are important things um as far as the bathhouse goes uh, we are building that up to compliancy with, um, to meet 
um, floodway regulation. So if you've been out to the park recently, you'll see that everything we build out there is up a little higher than everything that's older. Uh, so we'll be building that bathhouse the same elevation that we're building, that we built the Ferris wheel at, because uh, that meets flood elevations also. So, you know, uh, the pavilion is going to flood before the bathhouse and concession stand would flood. Now, even if we're not utilizing the bathhouse for whatever reason next year, uh, we're building a concession stand onto it also. Uh, so we can, you know, extra revenue next year uh, and have another concession stand that we don't currently have out there. So even, even on the days when the beach is closed, we can utilize that concession stand. Um, but again, like, like Mr. Charles mentioned, we don't have enough money to do all of it at this time. Uh, and so my proposal moving forward is to temporarily put the pier on hold until we can generate enough funds to go forward with it. And uh, would the bathhouse and beach kind of be put, uh, not on hold, so towards the back end of all, everything else we're doing? Well, the bathhouse in the current, in the current scenario that we have laid out, uh, everything would start this fall with the exception of placing the sand. Uh, the sand would be done next spring or closer to the time we open. It'd be one of the last things they do. Okay. But we would have to start on the bathhouse this fall if that stays in the project, uh, because otherwise we wouldn't have it done in time and construction would be happening during our season. So that would have to start this fall if we move ahead with the project. Okay, Alder Burnett. Yes, uh, Director Ditcher, I was not on the city council when this came through, I don't believe. I remember hearing about it, following it as a member of the public. Mm -hmm. what, what were the guidelines for the fundraising? You said a million for grants and a million for fundraising from, from the previous mayor. Both have fallen short, you know, one over half, you know, over halfway short. Mm -hmm. what were the guidelines given because it's been over two years and both of those fundraising targets have not been met well the guidelines that were given is we set a budget of of seven million and we set a goal of uh fundraising one million and grants of, of one million uh so we haven't met those goals uh, but we did bond for the money. Uh, we have spent some of that bond money on engineering fees, and we also spent some of that bond money to uh, build a portion of the pier that kind of juts out around the Ferris wheel. So some of that bond money has already been spent um, on engineering and uh, some infrastructure for the future pier. What was the timeline given, though, like when this project was first and voted on was the timeline for grants and fundraising indefinite that it'll be raised when it's raised or was there you have to reach this target like two years from now or three years uh there were no timelines set when the funding was approved and the plan was approved it was here's the plan let's proceed and do it as quickly as possible uh, we did get stalled uh with engineering uh, for quite a long time. So um, we ran into some obstacles there. Uh, we're now back on track with engineering, but really it was engineering hold up. It was an engineering issue that kind of held up the project for as long as it did. What was the date of the last donation and the date of the last grant received? Um, hold on, I have the donation info here, hold on. Uh, last donation that I'm aware of that came in. You know, I apologize, I don't have it. I just have the total dollars for the donations. I don't have the dates that they were they were done. You know, it's been a few months uh, since the last donation has come in. Though I can get that information for the council. As far as grants go, uh, we probably haven't received a grant in a year and a half on this project, uh, but we did apply for another grant, and I believe it was for two hundred thousand. And as and we're still waiting to hear whether or not we uh, received that grant. Uh, so the grant that we applied for was to buy all of the grooming 
equipment uh, necessary to, to maintain the, the beach and the sand. So there's a potential for another 200,000 grant coming in. Uh, Chairman Scandal, I don't have any questions for Director any anymore, but can I share my thoughts now or do you want to allow other questions for the Director? Well, uh, um, I'm sorry, I could, I could only hear half of what you said, unfortunately. Uh, that's fine, I, I don't have any other questions. <laughs> Want to allow other author asking questions, or can I add my comments on the situation now? Well, uh, you have the floor. You could. Yeah. I mean, uh, if we, if we have, um, open yeah. the floor for someone. We just focus on questions. But when you have the floor, it's yours to do with what you want. Yeah. So we have a very long, successful track record at the beach. You know, it's a jewel of the community. It's, you know, exceeded expectations on many fronts. I'm concerned that we hear from the leader of the friends group responsible for fundraising that they want to hold up a very large part of the project that we should move forward. The fact that we haven't met the fundraising goals and the grants haven't come, you know, after two years, I don't want us to get too far ahead to the point that when the project is moving forward and completed, if the dollars that we were told would be raised and received in grants, if they're not collected or received or even pledged at this point, will they once this project moves forward? And although we don't wanna think that something at Bay Beach could ever go unsuccessful, that is a definite possibility as horrible as that sounds. And it's not something that we can control completely. It's a natural, you know, the fact of being along a bay. So uh, I would, uh, my, my comments are, I'm, I'm very concerned. I, I, obviously I'll listen to the other conversations, but I think we probably got to really look at this thing more closely. And I don't think we're going to come up with a good decision here tonight. Uh, considering, you know, you're hearing from the parks director whose opinion differs from the fundraising arm of Bay Beach. So those are my comments. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Anyone else? Alder Johnson. Thank you, Alder Scandal. Um, Director Ditchai, when you um, when you mentioned, uh, I guess, phasing the the project, have you actually built out a phasing plan? Meaning, this is what phase one looks like, phase two, phase three. Really, uh, our phasing plan is we're building everything in phase one, and phase two is the pier. So do you have the cost broken out for each of those items? And in particular, do you have the cost broken out for what it would take to do the, the sand beach portion? I do, but I don't have that right now. Okay, and, and I bring that up because I think that would be valuable information for the committee to review, uh, for city council review, so that if the, the committee, for example, were to desire a delay on the beach portion, it'd be nice to know what that, that cost is. Um, and, and quite frankly, if a delay of that uh, if, if we did it later, would it cost the same amount to do it later or would there be an increase in cost to do it later, whether it's a rise in construction costs or because, you know, now we got to go over a boardwalk. I mean, I just think that that might be useful information for us to have. Um, the other piece is um, we've bonded for this already, correct? Correct, yes. And how much was that bond? The bond was uh, $5 million and we bonded it in 2018. Okay, and how much of that bond has been spent on the infrastructure for the Ferris wheel or other items? Um, hold on, I think I have that information. Even if you've got a ballpark. Yeah, just give me a second here. Ballpark's a different, different area. <laughs> that, 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 one, that one went way south. We lost that one too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, I, so I, I stop council. <laughs> Currently, we've we spent close to eight hundred thousand dollars on engineering and the infrastructure to start building the pier around the Ferris wheel. Okay, so we're still sitting on approximately four two four point two million dollars, correct? Correct. Okay, and and so I'll just maybe put a comment on that front. I I just personally I find it a little bit irresponsible for a city government to to borrow five million dollars and literally have it sit in an account and and not be investing it in a way that uh, the taxpayers can receive any type of benefit. 
Um, I, I think in an ideal scenario, we, we wouldn't have bonded for it. And I'm sure there might have been reasons why the bond request was put in when it was. Um, but I think it's important that we put that money to work uh, as quickly as possible for the benefit of the taxpayer that we're paying for it right now. Um, but what I think would be useful to understand again is when we look at a phased approach, what does that look like? We've got um, obviously two different recommendations before us right now. And I think it would be very useful for us to understand uh, what those costs are associated to do the boardwalk, to do the bathhouse, to do the pier, to do the beach. Uh, so that way we can make that determination, what, which of those items value to the project, um, but also recognizing that there's a shortfall in fundraising, how do we maximize, I guess, the, the highest percentage of yield or use out of those respective phases um, for, for the enjoyment of anybody who goes to Bay Beach? And, and I'm just not sure that the committee right now has sufficient information to be able to make an informed decision on that. Uh, so that would be at least a request that I would have is, is if it could come back next time with here are the phases, here's what they, here's what they would cost to do the phase. Um, and then staffs, I mean, we've heard Mr. Charles's recommendation, that's very useful. Uh, but again, uh, to hear Director Dichard's recommendation of, of how we're going to do that, in particular, if that, that remaining $4.2 million is enough funding to do what it is that's being recommended by staff. So those are my comments, thank you. Uh, I would just like to jump in, if I may, Alder Dishnight. Um, if the shortfalls in grants and fundraising, how does that affect this project? I mean, uh, we're restructuring the bond, so that should, is that to kind of cover up some of that shortfall or to, I mean, if what kind of a bind are we in it, on those shortfalls? Well, basically we're, we're doing two things. So one is we created a phased approach, which was put the pier temporarily on hold until we can generate enough money at Bay Beach to fund the pier. Uh, so we really wouldn't be affecting, all that that would do is it might affect uh, the timeline for future other projects at Bay Beach if the pier were to use some of the, the construction money uh, first. Uh, so that would be the downfall with the phasing plan by not uh, reaching our goals for grants and fundraising. Uh, the restructuring of the finance, the reason for doing that is so that we can save a considerable, considerable amount of money in interest payments throughout the years. Uh, so that's what the, the goal of the refinancing is going to be. So we'd like to save money in future years starting 2026. So, so you don't see that as being like an offset if we don't meet any goals, it's not really doesn't serve that function. It's not the purpose of trying to refinance. The purpose of refinancing doesn't help uh, pay for the peer and help with a funding shortage, other than after 2026, we'll have to pay less money in interest because mm -hmm. uh, we'll try to pay off as much of that bond as possible. So we would see a, receive a savings every year of approximately, about $170,000 every year in interest payments we would be saving by refinancing. It changes every year, so that's a, a rough estimate. Okay, yeah, and uh, uh, I wish I would have asked uh, Mr. Charles, and perhaps you, in your conversations, so you could answer this for me. Um, uh, he mentioned how they thought they should uh, put the bathhouse on hold, but uh, at the time, I've forgotten that that was also going to be a concession stand. Um, do they still feel the bathhouse should be in held, even though it would take away that concession stand? I mean, that seems to be a big benefit from my standpoint to, to go forward because we do have that concession stand then, even if the bathhouse isn't being used. Well, I will tell you that with my conversations with Mr. Charles, I will tell you that, uh, you know, I guess my opinion of our conversations is that uh, the friends would like to see the bathhouse being put on hold along with the beach, mm -hmm. even though there's a concession stand as part of it. Okay. Um, but if Mr. Charles wants to chime in and say yeah. anything different, I think we can open the floor. Um, but that's my recollection of how that conversation was. Uh, would you like us to open the floor, Mr. Charles, or are you good? 
Sure. Uh, I'll take a motion to open the floor. So moved. Moved by Alder Gerlach. Second by Burnett. Second it by Alder Burnett. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the floor is now open. Uh, I don't think you need to state your name and address again, so please just, uh, what is it? Yeah. <clears throat> I think the only comment we would make is your concern about the concession stand is really tied to the first two. If we don't have the beach and we don't have the bathhouse, we won't have the people using it that generates the real necessity for that concession stand. It's, it's on that north end and it's designed to support the beach and the bathhouse area. Uh, it, it'll always do some business, but the primary, it, they all kind of go together. If you don't have a beach, you don't need a bathhouse, and I don't know what Dan's feeling would be, whether you would still need a concession stand, but the concession stand was built for the traffic that the beach is generating on that end of the park. So that's why we lumped them all together uh, in the request. And one other just small point, and it's maybe not critical, but we don't know, the entire funding from the ex-mayor, none of that money has been given to the city. We hear it's out there, but it's in his possession. And theoretically, he can go spend it on anything he wants. It has not been donated. So it's not like we got three quarters of a million. We got nothing. And hopefully he'll do it. And I, I would expect he would. I think Dan would verify he would expect that. But at this point, we're dealing with an ex-mayor who's had this money for quite a while and we haven't gotten it yet. Any questions? I'll take that. I would like, I would like to comment on that, if, okay. if I may. Okay. Um, so as far as that fundraising, the city has received some funding uh, that is in a city account. Uh, other money uh, is sitting in the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, uh, which is under the account of the city of Green Bay and not Jim Schmidt. And then the other ones are commitments for fundraising. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Okay. I stand corrected then. Last time we spoke, I thought someone said we were waiting for that to be transferred to the city. Yeah, we have not collected the money from the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation. That is still in their account, uh, but it is under the City of Green Bay's account. So you can have it anytime you want it. Correct, yes. Okay. Correct. Alder Burnett? My question was answered, thank you. My question was answered by oh. Director Gershay, thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, anything else, anyone else for Mr. Charles? Well, motion to close the floor. Motion to close the floor. Motion to close the floor. <laughs> motion to close the floor by Alder Gerlach, seconded by Alder Weary. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the floor is now closed. Um, any further? To, oh, okay, Alder Dorf. I, I don't want to prolong the agony here, but so it is the reason that you wouldn't use the five million to put just put the pier in right now is because the beach would have to go in first um, because that, it seems like the pier is something everyone wants. Why wouldn't we just use that money or isn't there enough money for that? Well, I will, I will tell you that when the initial discussions occurred, uh, when we were looking at funding for this project, uh, my recollection is, you know, some people were very excited about the pier. Other people were also very excited about the sand swimming beach. So I would say, you know, it's probably a 50-50 split based on the comments we received back in 2018 is my recollection. Uh, so the pier was, uh, what we did was we phased the pier as phase two because that was such a large ticket item uh, that if we were to go with the pier, literally that might be the only thing we could do with the funding we have. I'll have to go over the budgets and see where we sit with things now and I can have that ready for you uh, at a future park um, but um, you know we can get a bigger bang for the buck to do a lot of these other things doing the shoreline beautification uh, doing the concession stand with a bathhouse which brings in an income source by paving the gravel parking lot that's out there 
uh, by doing the stormwater management, which is required for the entire site, not just for the, the beach project. So, you know, we can just do a lot more uh, with the fund versus up here uh, because that's such a large ticket item. So that's the reasoning behind um, the solution of the phasing that, that we went ahead with. Okay, thank that you. we're currently proceeding with. Uh, Dan, is uh, with the bathhouse, if we should end up, I mean, we're going to do the beach at the very end, and if it should up even next year, uh, we decide somehow to put it off even longer, is that bathhouse convertible for any other uses? That bathhouse will be a concession stand, it'll be restrooms, and it'll be changing rooms. So half of the building would be open to the public for the concessions and the bathrooms. Uh, and then the other half would be closed because that would be for the changing rooms. Right. And there's really no option to convert the changing rooms to any other use. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alder Gerlach? Would the chair entertain a motion at this time? I certainly would. Okay, I move that we ask staff to uh, spend some time updating the plan uh, as uh, Alder um, Johnson has asked and um, bring us more specifics in our next meeting. So would your motion be to hold this? The motion is to, to send it to staff for, I'm not exactly sure how to say it, for, for more specific information. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody could fix that. I, I second I that. that. Pretty good. I think that's good. If I could speak to that. Yep. I I yeah, I'll be honest. I, I wasn't expecting such a conversation at this meeting. But, yeah, I don't know if Alder Weary or Alder LaFave also perhaps didn't expect such an in-depth discussion. So I think there's more that needs to be discussed. And I think having the appropriate information from staff would be very beneficial to this committee. So thank you. I support the motion. Is that a second? Yes, sir. Okay, so we have a motion by Alder Gerlach and a second by Alder Burnett. Any further discussion? Alder Weary? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I definitely would want um, all the data and, and dollar figures and then the ramifications of any decisions, um, as Alder Johnson had mentioned. You know, what would be needed to proceed with the pier and boardwalk and hold off on the beach and bathhouse, kind of flipping the current plan? What would be needed? What would that look like? And then a cost breakdown of all those different elements, pier, boardwalk, beach, bathhouse, and then the other expenses we heard enumerated. I think if we have that, we can get a better handle on it and discuss it more uh, intelligently. So, so, so just so I'm clear, so, we're looking uh, yep. refer, refer back to staff to then present a phasing plan with budget or something to that realm? I think that's it, yes. I mean, we can, we can work on it, but I mean, something that you want staff to bring a phasing plan back with the budget for each, you each know. item. Yes. You know, I think right. most of it was going to be done in phase one. If we had it all broken down, I don't know, phase one, everything happens, boom, all at once, or if parts fit are, you know. Yep. That's and then what, and then Mr. Speck, what would that mean if, if, it, if the phasing was changed, if we just rearranged the priorities? Would that change anything or, or not? Okay. You're all good. Uh, okay, any, no further discussion, I'll, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, we're good. We're good. Uh, Item number four, consideration with possible action on this by Alder Stoyer to look at the feasibility in various site locations of a live in theater performing arts venue as is being done in numerous other locations. Alder Stoyer, would you care to chime in? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I spoke at length on this yesterday at plan commission. So I don't know if we're repeating things here or if we have it on two different committees. I'll go through it again. Well, but a short version? Plan, <laughs> what? A short version? 
Uh, go ahead. Plan, go ahead. Yeah, let me let me finish. Plan commission referred it back to staff for study. So I, I can go through it briefly. Um, a couple of citizens put in a request, you know, especially during this time period, you know, this health health situation and such. And I don't know how long it'll go on for, but they were talking about um, like drive-in theaters. Now, I granted, we used to have some drive-in theaters in Green Bay, and those are no longer here. But I was checking around in other areas around the state. Uh, there's a number of uh, drive-in theaters, either at a at a uh, the old-fashioned drive-in theater or along the side of a building, uh, different different spaces that are utilized by uh, by these theaters. So. I, did, I decided to do a little checking and for example, the Milky Way Drive Theater in Milwaukee, it's actually in Franklin and they use it at, at a ballpark. Uh, they, they have online ticketing only, uh, $35 a car load, 150 vehicles. So you stay in your car, they have a 40 foot LED screen and you use your FM radio and you tune into the movie. Uh, basically what I've found is that if you have a portable projector uh, Bluetooth, Bluetooth speakers, um, you have your movie in place, you drive up and you watch. So uh, there are several places around. There's one in Fish Creek, that's a drive-in theater called the Skyway. Shano has a drive-in theater. It's on the side of a building, it looks like. Field of Scenes is in Freedom. Uh, the Get Real Chilton Twilight Drive-In is in Chilton. And there's one in Oshkosh called the Fly-In Drive-In Theater. So I more or less just brought this forward, you know, I mean, uh, Alder Gerlach spoke to me a little bit about it too. And, you know, you know, did it pass, has it passed its time, you know, driving theaters. I, I went to driving theaters and a few of us can remember those. Mm -hmm. uh, when, and it was a big part of youth. I enjoyed them very much. Uh, over time, they kind of went out, but, uh, you know, with retro type entertainment that is out there, I think this is just another opportunity, whether or not there's a pandemic or not. I still think it's uh, kind of an interesting idea. And, um, you know, I just thought I'd throw it out there. Like I said, plan commission uh, met to uh, staff for study. And I know that even Alder Johnson, you know, down on, on Broadway, I thought they had uh, some possibilities for shows or movies along the side of a building as well. So, so that's about it in a nutshell. And uh, I'll take questions, or if, if anybody wants what to. What is it you're looking for? I mean, if plants looking at it, what is it you'd like us to do? Well, I'm I'm really not sure. I mean, it, it was a, on both. So <laughs> <laughs> if somebody can help me on that, I. Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, Alder. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Director Dishite. Yeah, since the Plan Commission is reviewing this already, and they've given been given direction, we can receive and place it on file for parks. Uh, and we can just work with the plan con uh, plan commission to see if there's a park location that would be suitable. So I would just say okay. receive in place on file is my recommendation. That would be fun. Okay. I'm okay. good with that. Uh, sure, uh, I could... Would we be competing with a potential business that might want to have this as a business opportunity? Or are we talking about doing something for no charge? I, I guess I, well, maybe it shouldn't even be talked about here. I don't know. So I think if they find out that it's not feasible, that's fine. I, you know, I'm just, you know, like I said, they charge in Milwaukee, they charge $35 a car load. So you might have five, six, seven people in a car. So there is cost and they do online ticketing. So it might be an opportunity for a new business. Uh, right now, movie theaters, you can't really check those out too much. So I don't know, maybe it would affect movie theaters in the long run as well. I'm just bringing this up as, an, as a potential option, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, Alder Gerlach? Would you entertain a motion for receiving place? I certainly would. I motion certainly. receiving place is on file by Alder Gerlach. Second, second. Second by just Alder Burnett. All in favor? Chair. Oh, yep. Chair. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Alder Johnson. Yeah, I, I don't oppose the motion, but I do have a, a question for Alder Stoyer. What exactly is the planning commission doing with this? What, what would they Well, do I mean, uh, that's a good question. They said they're gonna refer it back to staff. You know, I mean, I basically gave 
the, the specific committee as I did to plan commission. And Alder Dorf, you were, I think you were at the meeting, weren't you? Or Alder Gerlach? I don't know if you remember exactly what they said, but I, you know, it was. I, mean, I, don't know how, I don't know how they would do anything with this. Like, what, what are they going to tell you that it's legal to do it or not to do it? Like, I don't see any action that, that the plan commission would take from this. Well, well I, if you, I mean, I, we let our twin parks here and I really don't want to get far. Well, I know, but it's, it's important because I mean, the parks department would have to be the, the department that would actually execute anything like this. The plan commission isn't going to execute it. Well, so that's why Johnson, I if, if I could interject, uh, yeah. I think one of the things, I mean, the parks department, you have a hundred, you know, you've got 66 different parks that you might possibly could do it in. There are other locations in the city that are not parks. And I think plan commission might be looking at that as well. So it might be a combined effort between parks and plan. So I don't know if that's uh, double dipping. Yeah, I'm just looking for some clarification. <laughs> yeah, it's two, it's, two different, it's two different setups, I think. Okay. That's my thought. Thank you. So we have a motion, Alder Gerlach. I just think that um, what we need is not for someone to be looking for a place to do, do this. We need is a study, and I don't know by whom, to find out whether this is something that we ought to even be pursuing as a city. I, that's fine. I'm open, I'm wide open. Do I'm wide open. That belongs with us or with planning. Yep, okay. Uh, Anything else? Anyone else? I see no one else. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thumbs up there. So we're on to item number five. Consideration with possible action on the request by Alter Story to get an updated report on the signs bike repair stations and other amenities on the west side trail also to give an update on the trail expansion plans to the northwest of bond street and into the village of howard uh all the story should we just go right to uh, director uh, Dishnight, or is there something you wanted to well i'll, I'll just I'll, i'd like the director Dishnight to get involved in this of course uh, i uh there's a map i don't know if uh, dan if you can bring that map up and that, that it pretty much helped me a lot as far as knowing what we have there. Yeah, I don't know if I can bring that map up right now on my it's, it's, in, it's in the agenda. If you pull it up, each one of the committee members, you can pull it up. And yep. you can look at all the different uh, point locations as far as, uh, yep. you know, trail signs. The capabilities to share my screen with you. Okay. Uh, we have it. I mean, everybody should be able to look up on their own. Of course, those who, uh, well, even other alders right. should be able to go into uh, Civic Clerk and look at it. Yeah. Well, I, I just fully appreciate, you know, I've walked that trail numerous times and I, I'll make metal, mental notes and I'll just try to figure out, well, we, we could use a garbage can here or we could have used something else here. And it just seems over the last year that things have really picked up. And I don't know, if, Director, if you could, you know, throw a few things that way and, um, you know, it just seemed like maybe on some stretches there was no garbage cans, you know, between bond and military. Uh, and it just kind of how you decided to place what you did, where you did. Yeah, so, you know, real quickly, if you look at that map, you'll see where we have all the benches, signs, bike repair stations, and other amenities. So currently there's six benches, uh, several signs, one bike repair station, uh, one rotating art, uh, location and one dog waste bag station. So, you know, when we selected the bench locations, we did that in conjunction with uh, the neighborhood associations because uh, I believe they help fund those along with the, the dog uh, waste bag station. That was also funded uh, by, uh, I believe that that was either funded by the neighborhood association or with a, a different source. I can't remember who. I believe it's the neighborhood association. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, you know, as far as the trash cans go, uh, our staff members, you know, place them in kind of the high, the high impact areas where they're kind of easily accessible for emptying them. Uh, if you feel that we need additional trash cans out there, we can then, you know, assess that and see if, uh, if it's feasible to add another one or two trash cans onto the trail system. That's not a big deal. Yeah. 
I, I, I was a little remiss in not talking to Alder uh, Weary about this too, because the trail goes between our two districts. And, uh, you know, if, if what he has seen is adequate for him, uh, like I said, we're, the trail is standalone. It doesn't connect to the north or to the south. The goal, I think, eventually is to connect up to the east side trails in whatever way, shape, or manner we can do that. But I'd also like to get an update as far as uh, talks with the village of Howard and how we how we will connect up with that trail. Yeah, so I've also included a map showing the long range plan for connecting to that trail. Uh, so what we need to do is get from Bond Street uh, to, I'm gonna have to grab my map here. From Bond Street to uh, the to Vincent Road uh, in the village of Howard, uh, right on Taylor. And uh, we have a game plan to do that where we'll follow the street right of way uh, for a portion until we hit uh, Keller School. Uh, we have already secured a, a trail easement with the school district, it's a trail behind the school. Uh, we were able to do that last fall. Uh, so we currently have that easement in place. And then we need a second easement with the Bay City Baptist Church. Uh, so they're, they're just to the west of the school. And we had some initial conversations with them last fall because they recently acquired some property to the north. Uh, they were definitely interested in allowing us to run the trail through their property, uh, but they weren't ready last fall to grant us an easement because they have some plans for that property too. And uh, before they can decide whether or not they would grant us that easement, uh, they have to do a wetland delineation. You're not able to do one over the winter months. That has to be done in the summer months. Uh, so they already have a consultant on board uh, and they've started that wetland delineation process to find out where the wetlands are. Uh, so if we are able to fit the trail in on their property, along with them doing the work that they wanna do, uh, they are definitely excited about working with us with a trail easement to get us to Taylor. Uh, once we hit, ta hit, ta hit Taylor Street, it's really it's just a you know a half a block to hit Vincent Road. So uh, I believe it was last year the village of Howard rebuilt Vincent Road and they built a, a multi-use trail south of the road uh, for us to connect our trail to. So I wasn't able to touch bases with the village of Howard prior to the meeting tonight to see how far along they are on the rest of their project. Uh, but they are committed to this project because they were they did build a trail that we can connect to. Uh, so they see the value of making the connection. They did have a multi-year plan um, put together where it would take them about four or five years to make the final connection in Howard. Uh, but it is something that they are actively pursuing. So um, that's where we are right now. Uh, we did apply for a grant earlier this spring, a uh, construction grant for this trail uh, in the city of Green Bay limits. But unfortunately we did not get that grant. It was a DOT grant and most of the, pro most of the money went to road projects instead of trail projects, unfortunately. So uh, okay. we did not get that, but we'll continue to look Look at our construction purposes. Um, I know this already, but one of the goals that I had was to see this trail connect up to the Mountain Bay Trail in Howard, which goes all the way out to Wausau. So that that's the ultimate goal. Um, also on the trail, if you can, you go back to I don't know if you can bring it up, Dan, uh, where San Jose Place comes into um, the trail. Yes, I know what you're talking. I, I'll just speak a little bit about this. And I know, Randy, I know you've been on the trail numerous times. Um, but uh, there's a lot of uh, roadways uh, that do not connect up with the trail. And what I mean by that, there are cul-de-sacs where people will walk and they walk in the mud and it's all dirty, whatever. It's kind of a mess. And I wanted to show, I don't know if you can even see this, but this is from... I'll try it out. You can see a sidewalk here. Yep. Can you see that? Yep. That connects up to the trail. And I think it cost $3,280, something like that. Public Works did it. And I thought, what a great amenity to connect between a street right-of-way, and that's in all the Weary's district, uh, 
how that kind of he might even be able to fill me in a little bit about how that happened but it, it connects up to the trail but there are probably five or six other areas where people will ride their dirt bikes or they they mess up the underbrush and it's just kind of a mess and there's litter if there was some way uh, granted everything costs money but if there's maybe some neighborhood associations could get involved uh, there's different different possibilities here but i'd like to look at possible connection points where you could connect a right away up with that trail and that was just one example that I, I saw that i liked a lot yeah we can definitely add those it's strictly a funding issue uh, if we have money to build those trails we will uh, the one at san jose place uh, that was approved i think about two years ago it was installed last year at the time uh, we had a little extra money in our paving accounts to fund that uh, but uh, our paving account money account is fairly low right now. We talked about that at the finance committee uh, yesterday uh, when we talked about our 2020 bond request. So hopefully we'll get some more uh, paving money in our account and maybe we can tackle some of those uh, as okay. the year progresses. All right, I'd like more to discussions say, on that. Well, I'm good with that. I just wanted to kind of inform the council and others that you know the trail is there it's utilized quite a bit and uh, we would just like to see it connect up eventually to the north and to the south so i, I appreciate all the amenities that you brought to the trail the uh, outfit uh, setup is really nice uh and there's certain things that i just i don't even expect but they're there and i i, I commend your department for uh, doing that for doing thank that thank you that's all I have. Anyone else? Questions, comments? I believe a motion to receive and place and file in. So moved. Motion by uh, Alder Gerlach. Second by Burnett. Seconded by Alder Burnett. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's received and placed on file. And we got a thumbs up on to, uh oh, uh, all item six, consideration with possible action on the request by the Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute to install a boat decontamination unit at the Metro Boat Launch and staff it. Staff. Yeah, so I uh, submitted a, a, an attachment uh, to the agenda showing a photo of what this would look like along with a basic description there for you. But ultimately, the Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute contacted the city a few weeks ago, and they requested to install one of these uh, boat decontamination units at the Metro Boat Launch. Uh, they received grant funding, purchase and place several of these in the region, and the Metro Boat Launch is one of their top choices for a location to place it. Uh, so as you can see in the photo, uh, the decant contamination units are basically large portable pressure washers uh, to hose down boats after they're leaving for the day. So after they're done boating, they come out, you hose them down. Uh, the purpose of these units are to help prevent uh, spreading of invasive species from one lake to another or one water body to another. Uh, the units would be staffed by someone from the Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute. Uh, so they would staff it and this would be a free service uh, to those who ever want to utilize the, the boat or the pressure uh, washer. For now, they're only requesting to utilize the Metro Boat Launch in 2020 from June, late June through early September. Uh, the specific days of operation would most likely be Thursday afternoon, Friday afternoon and into the evening, and Sunday afternoon. Additional staffing days could be determined to match up with special events when they're going on at the boat launch. Uh, they would, if approved, they would provide posted informa information to discuss the hours of operation and then to uh, uh, schedule an appointment possibly uh, if a staff member isn't there. Uh, it would not be a requirement for boaters. This is purely an, op an optional service and there, I believe there would be no fee uh, for people who would want to use it utilize. Uh, they're still trying to determine if this would be a walk-up service or have this as a pre-scheduled service using online scheduling. Uh, they haven't made a determination for that yet. Uh, we do have somebody waiting in the chat room here 
uh, from the Sea Grant Institute to uh, discuss this. If you have questions, uh, you're more than welcome to open the floor to her to answer your direct questions. Does anyone have questions? I think this is great, wonderful, super. Thank you. <laughs> uh, fantastic. I don't see any problem here. Uh, any further discussion or anything? Aldo Weary, is that a no? Your thumb? Good. Okay. Well, then I would take a motion to uh, accept the grant. Yes. Yes. So moved. So moved by Alder Gerlach. Second by Burnett. Second by Jesse Burnett. Alder Burnett, sorry. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, that's great. It's super. Um, on to the last item. Uh, actionable item. Consideration with possible action on staff's cost estimate to have garbage cans in all parks year-round, specifically in the winter months. Uh, staff? Yeah, so per the direction of the park committee at the last park committee, we cost to keep garbage cans in all parks throughout the winter months. Uh, so during the winter, we would have around 100 total uh, garbage cans within the parks if we were to put them in all of them, of which 60 of those cans would be approved for this proposal. So we currently uh, manage about 40 garbage cans in our parks that have heavy use in the winter. Uh, there would be no cost for new for the purchase of new garbage cans because we would just use the ones that we have. Uh, but there would be a cost to, to purchase new lids for 60 cans. Uh, so the purpose of the lids is to keep the snow out uh, when it does snow because it gets, bags get too heavy if snow were to get in the garbage can. So the cost for each lid is $65 uh, for a total cost of $4,000 for those 60 new cans. Uh, so our staff did also take a look at the labor expenses of how much it would cost to, um, to empty the additional garbage cans. So uh, they're, they're estimating it would take uh, a crew 40 hours or one person 40 hours a week to drive up to uh, each park, uh, walk up to the cans and pull out the liners and put a new liner in. Uh, so the associated cost for this labor would be $1,500. Uh, per week, uh, and that includes salary and benefits in that estimate. So, you know, we can discuss questions if you want, uh, but I do have a recommendation. I'd be happy to answer questions before I give you my recommendation, though. Does anyone have any questions? I do. Hold up, Burnett. Dr. Dixie, you're saying that it's basically a full time position to the 40, 40 hours a week, you said? Yeah, that's what our, our crews are estimating. So in order to go drive to every single park, uh, pull up to the garbage cans, uh, they are estimating uh, 40 hours a week to do that. That'd be, uh, you know, that's city labor, obviously. Is that a, is that a, a, a cost specific to have an intern or a temporary employee, someone, you know, a reduced cost? Well, we, typically our seasonals are only uh, in the summer. We don't have a lot of seasonals in the winter months. Um, we could look at that as a possibility. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is with our labor costs, I mean, we do have a built-in cost. So we're paying the employees to do some work. Uh, whereas if we were to hire a seasonal employee, um, we would actually be paying more money in our budget because we would have to pay the employee to do something else anyway. Plus we now would have to pay a seasonal employee to empty the garbage. So, um, you know, it wouldn't take the full 40 hours per week. Uh, they're saying in that week, they would have to empty all the garbage cans once a week and it would cost $1,500 per week. Uh, that is more than what we pay one, in, or that is quite a bit less than what we pay one employee. So that's not a full 40 hour week. That's just how much of their week would have to be dedicated to emptying the garbage, which means they would have less time to do something else. So that $1,500 a week is not an increase to our budget of 1500 it just means for those hours they're emptying garbage instead of doing something else 
Oh, sure. I mean, there's an opportunity cost. I guess what I'm asking is, let's just say if you hire a temporary employee at $10 an hour, you know, 40 hours a week, that's $400 a week times 12 weeks in a year. I mean, we're looking at $4,800 in any insurance if they're, if they're temporary employees still. So, I mean, there are options that we have other than just having a city employee do it. Is that correct? Like a city, a current city employee, we can hire a temporary employee only for the winter months. If you're looking at impact to the budget, the cheapest way to do it from a staffing perspective is to do it with existing staff. Because if we have to hire a seasonal staff, that's an added dollar amount budget line item that we have to put in uh, to hire that seasonal staff. So, like I said, we're doing we're doing that instead of somebody else. So, if you're looking at strictly dollars and cents, we would have to add money to our budget to hire a seasonal staff, or do it with our existing staff, which would cost more per hour. But it just means that's already built into our budget. Right. I, 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 I said that it would cost fifteen hundred dollars with your existing staff to do it. What I'm suggesting is instead of using existing staff, hire a temporary employee at $10 an hour, you know, for 40 hours a week, that's 400 a week versus your 1500. Correct. You know, you know, so so dollar wise, it's cheaper. What I'm saying is I would have to add that seasonal staff to our sure. yearly budget. I guess the question the, com the the committee needs to consider is it worth spending four hundred dollars, four thousand uh, dollars, you know, a potential temporary labor to keep our city parks clean during the winter months? You know, that's a discussion that that we need to have. I'm just saying there are other options than using existing city staff. Well, it, if I may, it, it doesn't make sense to use. It makes sense to use staff. It, the question is not you're looking at the dollars, and really, it just the way to look at it is do we want our staff doing this or something else i mean we're paying our staff anyway it's just that that's the kind of that's the amount of money that would be ended up if you broke down each staff task which you could do and which is what is, they did for this this is what this task costs us the staff time but i would but, rather have i would rather have the part employees 15 to 25 dollars an hour working on more, more difficult tasks relevant to their education and experience and we can provide this at a let's just say lower skill and i'm not demeaning the qualifications of the person doing the work but i'm just saying there are other options there's an opportunity cost sure we could have our city staff you know be told to do this i would rather have them do some of the more advanced things that we need park employees to do and at a cost of less than five thousand dollars if we decide that i'm not saying we have to decide that. i'm just saying there are other options than using our city staff that's Certainly all there are, okay yeah, thank you thank you Jeremy. uh anything else let's hear from the director your uh recommendation other person Garlock is uh, raising her hand. And this All right, Alder Garlock. This question might be answered with your recommendation. Um, I don't know if we have evidence that there is actually a need for this during the winter months. And if so, if it is only in specific parks, such as where high school students go to have lunch, um, and if it's not necessary, I mean, if it is necessary somewhere, but not about the entire city. I, I, I just hate to divert city staff to do a job that doesn't really need to be done if we don't really have evidence that it needs to be done. That's all. Uh, your recommendation? Uh, my recommendation moving forward would be, uh, you know, to do this in, in this year uh, when we're asked uh, because of COVID-19, we know our budgets are going to be tight. Uh, we've been asked to find savings wherever we can uh, to accommodate our budget shortfall this year due to COVID-19. I just think that 
this year not be the best year to implement this with the additional costs we would have to incur. Uh, if you want to look at that at future years, we can go ahead and do that. Um, but it, um, is that really we haven't, uh, at a park standpoint, and maybe you as alders have, have received more complaints than I have, but the parks department has received very few complaints on this issue throughout the years. Um, and if you've heard more complaints, I'm, I'm definitely you know happy to, to listen to you and, you know, and take that into consideration. But I personally haven't been hearing too many complaints on this issue. Uh, Alder Galvin. Thank you. This is uh, my uh, thing that, that we're talking about today, and I was waiting to see what it would cost. Um, six, uh, four, four thousand, five thousand dollars for new covers. Uh, certainly, that's an expense. Um, Sixty extra cans to clean up. Forty hours uh, a week. That comes out to twelve parks. They would visit a day, which is just over half an hour for this person to drive from park to park. Uh, that seems a little. Uh, long, if you ask me, especially if we were to set up a route where they go from park, the closest park to the closest park. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I can't say for sure until we actually get someone in a vehicle and have them do it. Um, I guess the question is, sure, if it's, it's a crunch time, last year was a crunch time, the year before was a crunch time, the year before that was a crunch time, and the year before that was a crunch time. And there's that old question, if not now, then when? When is the right time? Um, you know, I mean, does the park department go through every spring and uh, have employees go along the edges of the park and through the park and pick up all the garbage? From what I see on social media, a lot of it's being done by citizens volunteering, making it their job to do it. Do citizens complain? I've certainly had numerous complaints. Um, I've seen it myself when I walk in the parks. Uh, we have a society that we're trying to stimulate to be more active, to use our parks more 365 days a year, not just during the summertime. Um, you know, and granted, we can tell people take that, take that garbage out with you. Um, you know, we, we, we can certainly make uh, cuts across the board to different programs that we do to make life a little bit easier. Um, so you know, I'm not sure what the perfect answer is here, but um, you know, it's, it's, Again, if not now, then when? And, and maybe maybe one way of uh, doing this would be identify the parks that have paths and areas that are being used by citizens. And I would sure hope the park department would be able to know what those parks are. I know the East River Park, I don't see a garbage can there, but there are a ton of people that use that trail along the uh, East River on the west side of the bank, a ton of people. There's a ton of people that use it. Uh, there's other parks that, yes, uh, Wesley Park over by um, East High School, uh, just off of uh, Mesa Street. I don't see much uses there during the winter, and maybe that wouldn't be a, a smart place to have a garbage can. But Colburn Park is another one that I visit quite a bit. Uh, Hinisra Park is another one that gets quite a bit of usage. I, I can't say if I remember if I've ever seen a can there or not. But there's a, a lot of parks out there, and again, we are encouraging people to get out and use our parks. We have ski trails, we have hiking, biking trails. We have fat tire bikes, we have people walking dogs. Uh, we certainly know that from the amount of complaints. So maybe we could identify the parks that get the most use, put the garbage cans there, see what the results are, and then uh, make a decision from there moving forward. Thank you. Alder Burnett. Well, I could suggest something. Alder Galvin, thank you for bringing it forward. I do think there's a possibility that neighborhood associations that you know, frequent the parks in those neighborhoods, there might be an opportunity that volunteers would be willing to do it. Uh, if it would be okay with you, I, I think an appropriate motion would be to refer, have staff refer it to the Green Bay Leadership, Neighborhood Leadership, I don't know the name of the group exactly, so I know it changed recently, but refer it to them to see if there's any volunteers to adopt parks for the winter months to empty garbage cans. I, I guess my concern would be oh, oh, oh. Who, who picks up the garbage. I mean, right. I mean, what, what do they do with the garbage when they pick it up? I mean, sure. I could see if you wanted to see the neighborhood association or that group wanted to raise the money for the covers. Yeah, um, I think that, I mean, all the time we were looking uh, at a neighborhood association near Keener Park that was looking for a, a grant um, 
idea. And I think that would be a great grant idea for them to fill up a mini grant to have a garbage container at Peanut Star and then have their volunteers empty it, you know, once a month or whatever it would be. So just an idea. Sure. Absolutely. I, I was just gonna I was just gonna say one one other option too if we're gonna work with the neighborhood associations is to ask them to adopt a park but not necessarily to empty the garbage cans but to pick up the garbage and and dispose of it if we have a garbage can there put it in the garbage can if we don't dispose of it at home uh, that might be a, a pretty feasible option uh, for a program for a neighborhood association to adopt because you know even if we do put out garbage cans uh, what you know when we do receive complaints we don't receive complaints about there not being a garbage can what we receive complaints on is when the snow melts and there's garbage all over uh, what happens is a lot of that is is blown in. Uh, so it's not necessarily people throwing things when they're walking through the park. It's, you know, you get a, a windstorm and something blows into the park and it gets hidden in the snow banks. And you don't see it until the snow melts. And then when the snow melts, that's when you see all of the garbage. Uh, so even if you put garbage cans in the parks, you're still going to get that issue where you get, you know, wind blown uh, garbage. And we do every spring try to pick up no basis uh, when the snow melts, uh, but we don't always get to it as timely as what uh, residents would like to see because we have a lot of parks in our system. So, you know, picking up garbage would be a great project for an association to tackle if they wanted to. Uh, Alder, uh, Alder. <laughs> I want to keep calling you an Alder, Director. <laughs> Director Dishide. Uh you think an, uh, an appropriate motion would be to refer this to staff to reassess where parks and to work with neighbor associations for uh, uh, adopting parks, helping maintain and clean parks? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely open to that. I'm, I'm definitely open to, you know, putting, putting garbage cans where they're going uh, would be a little concerned just to put them in every park just to put them in every park uh, but I don't mind putting them in locations where they're going to get used and people are going to put garbage in them so adding a few garbage cans in the more heavily used areas I don't have a problem with that at all we usually assess that on a yearly basis throughout the entire summer anyway uh, we can continue to do that in the winter months and you know on a case-by-case -case basis I have no issues or concerns you know moving parking cans or, or parking um, garbage cans around as needed uh, my only concern would be to put them in every park when not used in the winter uh, well let's start with Alder Gerlach then we'll go to a few of the other Alders Alder Gerlach I just wanted to tell you that the name of the organization uh, that uh, Alder Burnett was trying to think of is now called Green Bay Neighborhoods yeah Green Bay Neighborhoods and, um, my recommendation as a board member of the neighborhood of the year that had the one Memorial Day parade <laughs> is that it is highly unlikely that neighborhood associations would be able to accomplish this well. Um, I think that if you want to pursue that, you should refer it to Will Peters at uh, Green Bay Neighborhoods and you know, see what he thinks about it. See what see what that organization thinks before you rely on the neighborhood associations to do that. Yeah, well, I think it would be for uh, you know the director would talk to probably Will Peters because that's the to to present this to the. I mean, it it wouldn't be something we could force on or put. It would just be it would be a discussion. And then so. I would like to also follow up on what uh, Director Ditch had said about this winter being a real tough time. Perhaps this winter could be the time that we do the um, research and find out where garbage cans are needed and find out where this is a problem and then um, plan to uh, pursue this for next winter, the winter of 2021. Okay. Uh, why don't we go to Alder Johnson and then Alder Galvin and we'll give you the- Thank you, Alder Scano. Uh, one thing that hasn't been brought up yet you know, it's, it's for things like this, whenever you're talking about new programs, new projects, it's always best if you can to pilot something. And so maybe just a suggestion I would offer up is that 
Council just recently allocated some of the CARES Act funding towards the Conservation Corps. Perhaps this could be a reasonable pilot project that could be part of that Conservation Corps funding rather than um, taking from staff time, you know, where you could utilize the staff time for those kind of higher skilled projects. So I just wanted to throw that out there for something for discussion, but I think as part of a pilot program, the idea is that you track its success or failures. And so, I mean, literally that might just be pounds of trash that's actually picked up. It's not a hard thing to do, but then you can determine if in fact that it is something that's in demand or not, and then make changes before you make permanent permanent placements. That's all I got, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Alder Galvin. Thank you, um, and I, I forgot when I was initially speaking, I mean, I have had complaints from, from constituents about the garbage, but actually the thing that really got me poked in going on this was a young uh, child from Aldo Leopold who was part of an Earth Day classroom project, sent me a letter about pollution and about how the, the class was talking about things to make our uh, city and environment a uh, much, much better place to live. So uh, with that in mind, uh, as we reach out to some different organizations and that, potentially maybe we could reach out to the schools that have parks attached to their property and see if the school or some classrooms within that school would be willing to take this on as a project for them. I don't know, fundraising. I don't really want kids emptying out garbage cans. You don't know what's in there, but I mean, <laughs> something that they could get involved in that would you know, help them feel successful and also do something good for uh, their school and their community. Thank you. Anyone else on this? Then uh, a motion to refer to staff to assess and uh, move forward in uh, trying to get others involved. Would that be appropriate, uh, Director Dishnight? Yes, that would be appropriate. Is there a motion? I make a motion. Motion mm -hmm. by uh, Alder Burnett. Second. Second. Second by Alder Gerlach. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And we're on to informational. Uh, number one, request by Alderweary for staff to submit a plan for discussion to reopen city parks and city hall. Uh, director? Yes, yeah, so um, we were working on this plan. We have been for a while, uh, but we didn't have time to finalize it prior to uh, putting this on the agenda and getting the uh, council packet out the door. Uh, but uh, this morning, I emailed all of the park committee members uh, a copy of the plan uh, that we're proposing, uh, which will outline the reopening of all of our uh, facilities within the parks and what the timeline is for that. And um, I will be uh, placing this uh, document on the council agenda packet. So all council members will get a chance to see this. Um, but for right now, it's only the park committee that was given the information. So I won't go through everything in this plan. You'll, you'll get to see it uh, when it gets on the council agenda, but I'll, I'll highlight the, the main points here and kind of go through all of the different activities and what we're looking at. Now, I do want to tell you that all dates that I'm going to be discussing here are tentative dates. Um, it really is, a lot of it is due to um, you know, staffing. Uh, are we going to have enough staff to open these facilities? And also, are we going to be able to secure enough cleaning products and enough safety products to uh, adequately open and keep not only our staff safe, but the public safe? Uh, so although I may throw out some dates here, they're, they're still tentative dates at this point. And what our game plan would be is um, you know, as we get closer to the opening of some of these facilities, uh, we'll reach out to the press uh, in, in various press releases and notify the specifics of when these uh, facilities are going to open. And we will also post it on our website and try to get the information out so that the public uh, really has a good grasp of what's, what's happening in our parks. So currently, uh, 
uh, we have all tennis courts, disc golf courses, and basketball courts are currently open to the public. Um, and they have been for a while. Uh, just last week, we opened the tennis courts and the disc golf course. Uh, playgrounds, uh, I know that we're getting a lot of questions about playgrounds when we're gonna open those. Uh, so we would like to open playgrounds this Friday on May 29th. And then the skate park and Whitney Dog Park would open to the public on Wednesday, June 3rd. Uh, so what we're going to be recommending in those locations is social distancing. Uh, we'll put up appropriate signage so that people take that into consideration when they're using the playground, skate park, and dog park at Whitney. Uh, one thing to note is uh, we are not going to turn on any bubblers or drinking fountains until fur further notice per the CDC guidelines. So, um, you know, although these facilities will be open, um, the, the bubblers and restrooms aren't necessarily going to be open for these facilities. So, uh, City Hall, uh, it looks like what we'll be doing there is we'll start transitioning employees back on June 15th and we'll have a staggered schedule with a remote work uh, option uh, when, when we're staggering the schedules. And then we're currently looking at allowing the public into City Hall on Monday, July 6th by appointment only. Uh, and then we'll phase in opening it up to the public entirely uh, as we um, look at local public health conditions. So uh, Joe Falds is here if you want to have specific questions on City Hall and the opening plan for that, uh, because he has done most of the research and the work as far as City Hall goes. Uh, when we get to the shelter rentals and the restrooms, uh, what we're intending on doing is opening up select shelters on Monday, June 15th. Uh, so we're not going to open all of them because some of the shelters are very small and can't accommodate a lot of people and, and some of them just we don't get a lot of rentals on them. Uh, so what we're going to focus on are the, are the shelter rentals that are big and can, you know, have more room for people to move around. And they're also shelters that uh, typically uh, people want to be at uh, when they rent a shelter. Uh, so on the east side, we'll open shelters at Preble, Wilder, Astor, Triangle, and Kennedy. And then on the west side, we'll open the shelters at Muir, Murphy, Perkins, and Colburn. Uh, what we'll be doing is setting a capacity based on the available square footage and divide it by 36 square feet, which is the basic recommendation of, of how much distance somebody needs to um, uh, be far away from uh, the, another person. So 36 square feet per person is how we'll set the capacity for those rentals. So, you know, we are not going to accept large rentals at this point. Uh, we'll continue to evaluate it over the summer and we'll make the necessary changes as, as we go on. Uh, the restrooms will be available for rentals, but as I mentioned previously, they will not be available for general park use at this time until we have uh, you know, a better sense of what's happening in our community. Uh, there's a, a big uh, question now of Bay Beach Amusement Park and what are we planning on doing with that? Uh, as you've been hearing throughout the country and the region, amusement parks are starting to open up. Uh, so what we're looking at doing for Bay Beach is to do a soft opening on Saturday, June 20th, and also Sunday, June 21st. Uh, what we'll be doing for that is selling, um, we're sell going to be selling wristbands, a pre-selected number of wristbands. So it's not going to be open to everybody. It's going to be first come, first serve, and when those wristbands are, are gone, uh, we will not be allowing people in. Uh, so that'll give us a chance to review our, our implementation plan, see how it works with a, a soft opening with a limited number of patrons, and then we'll be able to adjust our plans accordingly uh, and make necessary changes so that we can open full time on Friday, June 26th to the public. Um, so one of the recommendations that's, that's out there is that we should be reducing our capacity by 50%. Uh, that is being uh, recommended by the Amusement Park Association and also the WEDC. Uh, so in order to do that, because we don't fence the area off and we, we have it open to the public to come and go, we, it's hard for us to um, 
be able to limit the number of patrons uh, coming in. So what we're going to do is we're only going to keep the main parking lot open uh, in the short term here, and all of the other parking lots will be closed. And then we'll also go with the wristband system. So um, by doing that, um, we may have to turn people away. In fact, we likely will have to turn people away because we can't have unlimited number of people in the park. So if they drive up and the parking lot is full, you know, unfortunately, we will have to turn people away. Uh, we'll do the best we can to post, keep our website posted and up to date with current information, but we, we may run into issues there. And then, like I said, and we'll go with a wristband system instead of a ticket system. Um, we will be removing all picnic tables temporarily uh, so that people can't picnic. Uh, there's really no way to sanitize those. Uh, and then temporarily we are going to uh, remove all shelter rentals uh, at Bay Beach uh, so that people can come and, and use the rides and ride the rides versus uh, rent the shelters and, and uh, take up a lot of the wristbands uh, use it and sitting in the shelter. So. We will accommodate uh, safety precautions on all the rides. Uh, we'll have, um, we will uh, block off seats and rows for rides. Uh, we will sanitize in between rides. Uh, the queue lines will be properly marked to ensure proper social distancing. And so, you know, all of the rides will be operating at, at a reduced capacity until um, you know the numbers come down and we move into a different phase of um, of reintroducing um, people back into the park, um, we will have the pa the pavilions and concession stands open, but we'll use be utilizing all the precautions that restaurants use. Um, so you know it won't be any different than than going into a restaurant, uh, which you currently can do. Uh, so that's what we're doing for Bay Beach. Um, out at the sanctuary, uh, currently most of our trails and outdoor animal exhibits already are open and they have been throughout this. Um, as far as animal, uh, it, taking in injured animals, we have only been doing it on a case by case basis, uh, but starting June 15th, we'll begin accepting all injured animals again. Uh, we intend on, uh, starting our summer youth programs on June 22nd on a limited basis. Obviously, we'll have all the recommended precautions in place for that. Um, and then we'll reevaluate the programs throughout the summer months. All of the buildings and any other remaining animal exhibits, uh, we're, we're hoping to open July 6th. Uh, and obviously that is subject to change based on uh, where we are at with COVID-19 in Brown County at the time, but hopefully we'll open all the buildings on July 6th. So at the sanctuary, we're going to take a phased approach uh, from now until July 6th, opening that up. When we get to the pools, um, Colburn Pool, we would like to open in early July. Uh, we feel that um, you know, there's enough safety precautions out there that we can safely open the pool uh, to um, both open swim and for lessons and also allowing um, the, <coughs> excuse me, the swim teams to use it in the morning. <coughs> I will tell you that uh, because we weren't able to train lifeguards this spring, uh, it is very likely that uh, we won't be able to open up the other two aquatic centers. But if we do have enough staffing to open up at least one other one, we would look at opening up Joanne's. But at this point, uh, we can't tell you how many pools we can even open because we don't know what our staffing is. So like I said, we would begin the process of, uh, of moving forward with the Colburn pool and then we'll just go from there depending on our staffing levels. Um, so, you know, we do have a, a basic capacity level based on 113 square feet in the pool. Uh, this is kind of the circumference area of, uh, of a circle if somebody were standing in the pool. Uh, so those were determined by aquatic guidelines based on the six foot diameter circle. 
Uh, concessions, if we open concessions, it'll only be for prepackaged food. We will not sell anything other than prepackaged because of uh, social distancing concerns in the concession stands. Uh, so we can really only have one person in each stand, so prepackaged is the only way we can go. Uh, we will do the appropriate trainings uh, as necessary. Swim lessons will, an open swim will do those, but uh, they will have to be modified uh, to have capacity limits and keep social distancing. So, um, you know, we've been working fairly closely with our staff to put together a plan for that. Um, and just so you know, um, for all of these divisions, our staff member is putting together a very comprehensive, detailed plan of how we're going to keep all of our employees and the public safe for all of this. The document you have before you is just a summarization of a few bullet points and also um, the dates that we're looking at. So it's really a lot of information in each plan and these plans are well thought out and take all precautions into account. So just so you're aware of that, we've done that for all of the things that we've talked about so far with pools, Bay Beach, Sanctuary, et cetera. Uh, the waiting pools and splash, splash pads, we're hoping to open around the same time as Colburn Pool, uh, but we do have some things to work out to determine staffing needs and safety procedures before we're able to uh, kind of put a date on that. So uh, we're hoping to open those around the same time. Maybe we'll take a phased approach with that, but we're really not sure with the waiting pools and splash pads. Uh, playground program. Uh, that's a pretty active program on a traditional uh, year. Uh, we're hoping to begin our playground program on July 6th. Uh, we do, a, you know, similar to our pools, we are anticipating a shortage of summer staff uh, because, you know, these summer positions are starting mid-summer and a lot of these people want to work all summer. So it's very difficult. It may be very difficult to find enough staff members to run our playground program. Uh, so what we're going to do is kind of take a phased approach with that too. Uh, we'll see how many staff members we can get uh, and then see where, which uh, sites make the most sense. So when we're able to announce which sites we're going to run and how many staff members we'll have, we'll make that available to the public. We just don't know that at this time, but I think it's fairly safe to say that we will definitely be operating the playground at a reduced number of no locations uh, due to a staffing issue. And then we are going to tweak the program to keep the leaders and the children safe. So we'll keep it a maximum of two leaders per site with eight children maximum. Uh, and we'll have all the you know safety precautions necessary to do social distancing, uh, sanitation in the bathroom, sterilization in the bathrooms, et cetera. Uh, I will let you know, I do want you to know that the schools will not be providing summer lunches at any of our playground programs this summer. Uh, so that in itself will reduce the number of uh, uh, people in the program because a lot of children come for the, for, the free, for the lunch and then they stay for a while after. But we are not going to get the lunches in our parks. The school has already made that decision. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll likely hire a s additional seasonal staff to uh, st sanitize the restrooms on a more regular basis than we typically would do. So we are taking a lot of precautions with that program. Like I said, we're hoping to start it around July 6, but it's dependent on staffing. City band concerts are gonna be held off for a while here. Uh, we're hoping to do those in mid-July. And again, we'll look at, we'll work with the city band to see how we can implement uh, social distancing requirements. But again, we won't start those until we're sure that uh, everything is safe and we're ready to go. Uh, youth leagues. Uh, we would like to start allow people on our field. So I think a lot of the leagues can be done fairly safely uh, with some precautions in mind. So what we would allow is practice was, would start on June 5th, 15th and games would start on July 1st. Uh, and what we're going to do and how we're gonna handle the leagues is we're going to leave it up to the leagues to decide how they, whether or not they want to run their season. We're not going to mandate it. The leagues themselves get to make that determination. And then the leagues have to provide a safety plan to the city for us to review and approve. Uh, so basically they will have to decide 
uh, what their social distancing guidelines are, how they're going to keep their uh, spectators safe, how they're going to keep the, the participants safe, and then how they're going to manage that and supervise it and enforce it. Uh, so all of that will have to be put down in a plan and they'll have to submit that to us for their review, for our review and approval. Uh, so because it's their leagues, we're just allowing them use of the field. It's really up to them to figure out how they're going to manage those practices and games. Um, for our leagues, uh, we hope to begin in mid-July on those leagues for our adult sports leagues. And again, we've already started looking at how what procedures will be put in place, where they can play, et cetera, and we'll be um, working uh, with the different leagues on that. Uh, for the Blue Ribbons and the adult soccer, uh, the Blue Ribbon is the team that plays at Joanne Stadium. Uh, we would allow them to begin practices on June 15th and games on July 1st also. And again, they will have to put together their plan for social distancing and guidelines on, on how many spectators they can have in the stands and how they're going to meet uh, safety precautions. And we'll review and approve that plan with, with those um, with those uh, entities. Uh, for special events and neighborhood association gatherings, we would start that on June 26th for special events. And they'll be allowed, but they must follow current CDC guidelines and uh, show us how they're going to do that. And all special events would need to get approval from the special events committee. And so all of that will be reviewed with the committee at that time anyway. And then finally, um, programming. Uh, so we would begin our programs in the near future also, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, doing programs and uh, doing them a little bit differently than we did in, in the past to select programs where, you know, we may have less uh, participants and, you know, we would only select programs where we can get the appropriate uh, physical distancing requirements and have the safety precautions. So, like I said, it's a lot of information, but we have a lot of amenities in our parks. We have a lot of facilities. Um, and, um, you know, I just kind of highlighted some of the major bullet points and the timing that we're looking at. And please keep in mind, like I said, these are all tentative dates. I know I said that once or twice in this presentation, but, you know, we can't guarantee any of these dates as the specific timeline or the date that is going to be a hard and fast decision because there's still a lot, a lot of moving parts and we, we still have some things to figure out before we can actually open them. But I will tell you that we are not going to open these unless we feel 100% certain that, you know, we're doing the best that we can uh, to keep our staff and the public safe. Thank you, Director. Uh, Alda Weary, you brought this forward. Anything you care to, or anyone else? We'll start with Alda Weary if... There we go. I muted. <laughs> Didn't want to listen to the dog again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, Dan. I appreciate the report. And putting it together is pretty, you know, pretty length. Imagine did a lot of work to get this together. Uh, wondering about several things, but first off, uh, leagues like baseball and soccer. Why would we require them to submit a plan? Why wouldn't we just open them up for use and then allow them within the organization to figure out how they want to address it? I'd like to defer to James uh, about this uh, this issue. He works with the leagues uh, regularly, and he's had discussions with them on this topic. I think one of the main reasons that uh, we don't want them to submit a plan is because we actually sanction our user groups. So they are sanctioned by the city, city, and they have to follow a certain facility use agreement and policies as set forth by the park committee. That was set by uh, back in, I think, 2008, I believe. And they have to uh, follow certain guidelines in order to utilize our fields. Uh, and most of them utilize their fields for no cost because they are sanctioned groups. They have their own boards, they have, they have all that things. And, and, and you are correct, but what we're seeing from around the area is any groups are um, moving forward with allowing this type of activity. They are requiring them to at least have a safety plan in place. And most of them are actually coming to the board for approval. 
um, we're kind of, I, I guess, taking on that portion instead of coming, having it come to your board for approval. Um, that could be an option we do to also is to ha actually come to the board. Um, but I think in order to make sure that they are following all CDC guidelines as set by our uh, county health department and all of the different requirements that we're seeing out there that are allowing uh, these to move forward safely, uh, I think it's just best practice, I guess, at this point to do that. All right, thanks. I, I really think it would be okay just to open up the parks for use by soccer and baseball and let those groups, those parents decide if they're okay with that sport. As we know, soccer especially, you're running into people all day long. So there's gonna be no plan that's gonna be able to address distancing. Um, baseball, you're all in the dugout together. Unless you know, you're gonna need five dugouts to keep them all six feet apart. I think you let each group and their parents decide yeah, it's a typical risk or it's not. Um, I think this was way overboard on what we were requiring. I really suggest we, and those groups can determine how to proceed. Maybe they won't get any players, but I think there will. I can tell you from a refing standpoint, I ref soccer. Uh, I'd have no problem refing any soccer games, none. And my daughter would have no problem playing in soccer. I think we're way too restrictive and we're gonna crush a lot of people's summers over uh, too, too restrictive of things. But I have more comments for later, but that's, that's all I have for now, thanks. I will, I mean, I will add uh, on that one that um, just so you know, most of our user groups um, I think actually pretty much all of them we work with have already submitted that safety plan and we are currently reviewing them. So it's more of, uh, you know, it's more of just the date we decide to, to let them, you know, practice and play, I guess, at this point. And uh -huh. that's kind have of you what heard we're... soccer, Jim? Uh, what I've heard from soccer. Have you heard from soccer? I've heard two, two leagues have canceled and one is still considering. Right. The kickers and the strikers, the two main leagues in Green Bay, East and West Side. Yeah. Yep, they, they informed us of that. Their board made that. Uh, yeah, I think let them operate. Don't make them jump through a bunch of hoops. Oh, we, we they actually made it. What are ridiculous? No, they, they made that decision and told us, just so you know. That's because of all the hoops they have to jump through. The, Uh, that's it for Alder Weary. Anyone else? Right. Alder Burnett? This is, this, is, this is Alder Lefebvre. Oh, uh, Alder Burnett and then Alder Lefebvre? Uh, you're about an hour and a half late, Kathy. Your item was handled a long time ago. <laughs> I know. I couldn't get in. My computer. I, I'm having all kinds of trouble with this computer. Okay, I could well, not uh, get in to get, to get my numbers. Okay, but you, you know what item we're on now? Yeah, you're way down. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Alder Burnett? So oh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Director Ditchay, or maybe uh, Mr. Uh, Anderson, if you could answer. This is an informational item. So does the city council have any authority? So say if we disagree with some of these decisions, does the city council have any say or vote to overturn or to a little more? Um, I was just looking to see if uh, Vanessa so I still here. I know. I thought she was going to be in the meeting, but I don't see her here. Um, I mean, ultimately, at this point, because it is informational, and maybe uh, Vanessa can give a clarification at the city council. Uh, but uh, my understanding is you can give a recommendation, uh, but because it's informational, uh, you can't make a motion to that. And then. Uh, that can consider your recommendation. But uh, again, I would have to defer to uh, Vanessa to speak to that, and she can do so at the council. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I'm wondering why is this informational? That's why you put for discussion so we can actually discuss it and work on it. Yeah, I had actually tried to get a hold of you. Uh, we can discuss this afterward instead of, but it was, it was something happened at the very last. Uh, it's, it's involved. But I tried to get a hold of you, you so that we, if you had gotten back to me, uh, but you didn't get back to me, and I understand why you've got some issues going on here. But uh, there was a change made. I did reach out to you. We never made contact. I can explain the whole thing to you. Uh, why don't we do that later? You can explain it now. That's okay. Yeah, just... Why isn't it uh, for debate? 
because I don't need it, it offline. Well, <laughs> well, no, it, it, uh, if everybody wants to know, uh, it started out, I, I reviewed the agenda and then I raised some points. I wondered uh, why some, it seemed to me this was an informational item. Uh, and I had wondered what, why we a lot of communications by alders that are informational and we end up putting them in business. And I wondered why we just didn't put it in informational. And then uh, that's exactly what happened. And then I, through that process, thinking about it, I thought, well, it really doesn't matter for me as I thought it through. I mean, there's a logic to putting informational, informational and business and business, but I mean, we're gonna cover it either way. And we've done this many times and we just received them placed on file. So in the long run, I thought, well, it doesn't matter. And I was going to get a hold of you and ask you if it mattered to you. And if it did, I was going to amend the agenda to put it back into uh, a, a business. Um, but we didn't connect and so I just let it ride. But uh, no, that, that's the way I submitted it. So I don't know why you change it without getting my okay. You changed my motion. <laughs> so I, I, totally no, I, I, did to, I did try to reach. I did. I did try to reach out to you, and we didn't connect. Check but your, you didn't check say your why. I mean, I was out of state, and of course, I had someone in the hospital. So leave yeah, the agenda I know. I understand alone. why you didn't get a hold of me, but I did reach out to you. But you changed the agenda item, Mr. Chairman. That's not acceptable. Uh, well. I didn't change it in talking with staff. They changed it. I said, well, um, they t notified me at the change at on Friday. I didn't see that until it was too late. So then we talked about amending it. And then that's when I reached out to you to see if it mattered to you and we didn't connect. So does it have anything to do with that right now? I, initially I okayed it in the business, then in talking with staff and just problem solving of maybe in the future, uh, making informational more informational. Uh, but like I said, as I thought through of it more, I thought it really doesn't matter. But by that time, the agenda had been changed and we could have amended it, which I would have done if you would have wanted, but we didn't connect. So in I the future- I did want it this way, where did it? <laughs> well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's any action we could take on this anyway. Uh, well, is that because we of the here to talk on that, but the order right now, everything I can't, you're breaking up. Probably. So we seated over our power and we get no say over the parks. That's wonderful. Okay. Just remember that on our next vote. What does that mean? Is the point of war on order. our next vote, whether or not to have emergency powers, we seated all our control over this. That's probably why it's yeah. informational. Well, this has nothing to do I with the know why we're meeting. This has nothing to do with emergency powers. This has to do with executive power and the executive running the city, whether it's an emergency or not. The executive is in charge of running the city. It's got nothing to do with the emergency. All city anyway, facilities. Uh, all all the city facilities. Facilities. I'm not, I'm not involved in your disagreement. We can't hear you, Jesse. We can't hear you, Jesse. What? Oh. You're, you're breaking up, Jesse, sorry. Oh, okay, how, how about now? Better. Actually, a question I had, because I noticed that the agenda was amended. My original question when this whole thing began, I said, does the council have authority in this decision? Right. So when the agenda first came out, it was under regular business, so the city, count, this committee could have made a recommendation um, through a motion, whereas right now it was changed to informational, which basically means that there's absolutely nothing we can do to take a vote on any changes to that that plan. So was that a change you made, or you made Alder Scannell under the you know advice of the either the mayor or the city attorney's office? I'm trying to understand. Did you make that decision as chairman? Because I. I really thought we would have some give and take and possibly make a recommendation because, so wh whose decision was that? Was that yours solely as chairman or were you instructed? Or that. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I, yeah, 
I, I can speak to that. So ultimately, when this uh, recommendation came forward, uh, I reached out to the law department to ask for a recommendation of is this informational or is this an action item? Uh, their recommendation was that it's informational. Uh, so we put it on the agenda that way. I did review it with Alderman Scannell uh, before the agenda was posted. Uh, we amended the agenda after the fact, but originally we did have it on as informational. Uh, we, agen we amended the agenda because there was an error in civic clerk and the agenda packet didn't get uh, posted properly. Uh, and so we, we made that change uh, to include all the attachments. Plus, uh, in the meantime, I, I spoke to Alderman Weary and he had requested that uh, he be added to Alder Lefebvre's communication on item three. Uh, so I did make that that change three in the amended agenda also. So that was the amendment, but I guess the question is, when this first, unless I'm seeing things, when this first was published as an agenda item, it was not an informational item, it was an actual regular business item, is that correct? I don't think it was, I think it was informational from day one and we never changed it to action. Okay, I, I might, have, might have seen it wrong. So I guess the question though is what counts, what authority or what discretion does the council have on any of this? Um, so if I disagree with some of these recommendations other than airing my grievances here and trying to you know, convince you, you know, to, to change things a little bit, what authority does the council have? Are, are we just nothing? I mean, I, I need that answer to understand where we go from here. And unfortunately, unfortunately I don't have that answer for you because uh, uh, the law department is not in on this meeting. Okay, so- it's my the, understanding, I'm sorry, it's my understanding that we can make recommendations, but we can do that. We don't have to do that as a committee. We can do that individually. We can meet, you know, those are, uh, it, it makes no difference if it's coming from us as a body or as individuals, it, it would just still be recommendations that they would uh, take under okay. advice. In the uh, document that you shared, Director Dichette, we're talking about that now, so that's a public item for discussion. And Correct. I can uh, there, are, there have been a few members of the community who have requested information regarding what the plan is. I can release that through email, the city councils? I, I would think that that would be okay. Like I said, I am going to be posting this on the city council agenda. It just wasn't done on time to make it onto our agenda. So I would feel comfortable if you wanted to share this information because it will be on the council agenda uh, come Friday. Well, the sooner the better. I mean, these, these are and again, Director Ditchhead, I know we're in tough times and a lot of tough decisions need to be made and we have to balance public safety versus access for the public to these services and our facilities that they own, that, that they're entitled to as taxpayers and members of the community. I understand that's difficult. Um, but I think the more public airing this document has, the better. I'm hoping the media kind of picks up on it because uh, I would love to hear members of the community, you know, voice their opinion. Should pools be open? Should we do more recruiting for lifeguards out of our normal channels? Um, are we willing to look at things a little differently? There are a few questions I had, and, and I'll kind of and give up the floor to whoever wants to speak, but if the square footage of 113 is, is the requirement at Colburn, one per 113 square feet. How many people could be at Colburn Pool at any given time? What's the maximum? Ann or James, have you uh, looked into that? Do you have her? Yes, I have it. Hold on one second. For um, the pool vessel, if you take 113 square feet, um, as your um, measurement, we could have 146 people within the pool vessel at one time um, or 128 people on the pool deck. So we just would have to make sure um, that we would look at the difference between the pool vessel and the pool deck because if we do have to clear the pool, we need to make sure that we 
you have enough square footage in between each person on the pool deck. Um, so we would have to take that lower number if we wanted to run 13 as the standard unit of measurement. So between 120 roughly to 146 is the maximum in the pool at any given time? Correct. Okay. Um, you know, limiting access to the other two pools will then cause people this pool. Colburn is typically, we, it's any given summer, that's one of the pools that have the least number of people with it being a new pool and the fact that according to this plan, the two other aquatic centers and potentially our splash pads will be delayed in opening or, or not opening at all perhaps, the pools, not necessarily splash pads, we're going to have a lot of people wanting to get in and I think we need to do our best to make sure that all pools are pools. Director Dickshite, I noticed that the lifeguard positions have been posted on the website, the city website for over 30 days. How many applicants have come forward? Have you had any interviews? How, how, where are you at right now with staffing? Ann, can you speak to that? Sure. Hi, sorry, this is <laughs> no. this is Lucas. Um, <laughs> thought I'd put my video on here. Uh, yeah, so we actually only have, I believe there's nine lifeguard applicants and only a handful are actually certified. Um, currently, we're not able to certify lifeguards um, or we're, we're gonna have to come up with a new plan just because there is so much um, close contact when it comes to lifeguard certification. Um, so that's the roadblock we have. So we do have a few applicants that we can bring in. We also have our handful of returning staff that hopefully will um, um, continue working with us. We have the opportunity through the Red Cross to have a 120 day grace period for any lifeguard who certification does an out this summer. So we don't necessarily have to worry about recertifying our current staff. It's just a matter of finding staff that are already certified because we have not been able to run courses. Right, and, and I think, uh, you know, some social distancing of pools is necessary. And I know that some other pools throughout the community have announced closure or partial closure, and they've been breaking, you know, team hourly, not hourly, but daily. Um, Little Shoot is going to be open. Um, they're going to have 100 people in their pools, from what I've been told. Some of the other facilities that are not going to be opening, couldn't we just, you know, quickly try to recruit those lifeguards to Joanne's and Rush? That's what we're doing. I have my whole, pardon the pun, pool of staff. Um, and we will put them wherever we're opening. I've surveyed my staff to see who's available and who's willing to work at different pools in the event that their regular home pool would not open this summer. Okay. So I have all of that information and that is the plan moving forward. And, and I do I do want to mention that, you know, ideally we would open all three pools. Right. I do just want to let you know that realistically, that's going to be a challenge with our staffing level. So I don't want to say we're going to open all three pools when there's a very likely scenario that we couldn't even make that happen in any scenario as a staff. So our phasing here is we'll open Colburn first. And then if we have enough staff members to open a second pool, we will. And if we have enough staff members to open the third pool, we'll consider that too. Um, we're going to go one pool at a time, and when we hit, when we can't get any more staff, that's where we end. Thank you, and uh, Director, you beat me to the punch. I want to clarify that in the sake of the folks in front of them, that you did very clearly put that Colburn would be the initial rollout, but we're not sure. You're not ruling out opening those two other pools, but you're you're going to you know, keep that option open. Uh, tables at Bay Beach, picnic tables. Why are we removing those? That the, you know, if a family wants to have a lunch or be out along the bay, why would we remove picnic tables? 
Uh, Jason is, is in this meeting. He's the manager out at Bay Beach, and he can answer that better than I. But really what it comes down to is a sanitation issue. Uh, where we won't have the staff to monitor all of the picnic tables and sanitize those on a regular basis as people come and go. There's so many picnic tables out there, we don't have a good way to monitor that and, and sanitize them regularly. But Jason, if you have anything else to add, feel free. Yeah, we're, we're actually looking at ways to actually keep a few out here. Uh, we would just have to keep them maybe in groups of two and uh, separate them throughout the park. And then that, that way we would have fewer that we'd have to sanitize after each uh, user, but it would still uh, offer enough for people that are there to to enjoy some of the picnic space. And you know that would also increase the amount of people that we could have in, in, in the park at any given time. Uh, lock restrooms. Right now, the restrooms are locked. I'm a person that needs to use a restroom even if under an emergency. I can't get into the city restrooms. I know you want to open it up for the park shelters for people who are renting the shelters, but why don't we open up the restrooms for the parks with proper you know, guidelines to ensure some level of sanitation? That's the biggest concern is, is, get, is meet, being able to meet those guidelines with a certain level of sanitation. Uh, you know, we would have to, there, we have a lot of shelters with a lot of restrooms throughout our parks and we don't have the staff to adequately and safely sanitize all of the restrooms on a daily basis with the staff we have. Uh, so what we're doing is we're selecting the locations, like this whole plan that we put together is a phased approach. Uh, so as the number of um, COVID cases in the county diminishes, uh, we'll reevaluate the plan and we'll open more shelters or maybe open the bathrooms so we wouldn't, when we don't have to sanitize as regularly. Uh, but initially to open them all, all up uh, and have to sanitize them that frequently on all of the restrooms would be difficult or problematic or nearly impossible to do it to the level that I would feel safe and comfortable with. One last question, Chairman. The 36 square feet per shelter. So we're going to take the square footage per shelter and divide it by 36 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's going to greatly reduce the number of people who even want to use those because the point of shelters is to have you know family events, birthday parties, you name it. A family. Right. So many members, people who might be wanting to rent the facility would be a member of a like group of family, perhaps 10 or 20 people in a close-knit family that are not socially, socially distancing outside of the parks. So, you know, what's our, if a shelter is, what's, what's a typical shelter? What's a middle-sized shelter square footage? I don't have that information off the top of my head. I apologize. It's like 20 by 20. That's a typical shelter. What we would do is we would take the outdoor space into consideration with our square footage also. So it's okay. not just the inside shelter. It's the it's the overhang area also. Right. I'm not, uh, one last comment and I'll, I'll kind of I'll be silent for a moment, but the reason I ask these questions, Director Gibson, it's not an attack on you or your planning. It's a difficult, difficult decision, but these are the uh, questions the public's going to have, and the public needs to be involved in, in, in understanding how these decisions were made, that some of the uh, differing opinions have been listened to. So a lot of the questions I just posed were questions that I have been receiving, questions that I've had my, on my own, I believe summer is here. There are kids throughout the entire community that perhaps don't have air conditioning. They do not have a close knit family at home, two parents at home to watch them. They have limited economic means. And I think we need to do whatever we can to safely open up as much of our parks as possible. And so I, I know the questions may have been kind of tough and seem like they're attacking the parks department. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just getting the answers for all the people that really want access to our public parks to be able to enjoy the amenities that they pay taxes to support. So thank you. 
And we've taken all of those things into consideration when we put this plan together. Um, you know, like I said, it's it's going to be a phased approach. Hopefully, the number of cases will go down in the near future, and we can change the approach uh, fairly quickly. Um, but uh, I guess I would have some concerns with just opening everything all up right out right away, uh, with very little consideration as far as you know trying to keep the public protected so um, I would have, I, one thing one last comment i would have concern if this was just an informational item at the full city council because then basically the entire city council you know is basically needing to and that was my original question what authority or what input are we even allowed if it's just informational then we have to go along with it we can voice our concerns we can express our you know frustration with some aspects of this. Um, but I'm hoping when it goes to the full city council, it's not informational that the, the city council could make an action or a motion um, to change this a little bit if we see fit. Not saying we will, but I want that authority to be able to make that recommendation. Thank you. I, I want to make a comment. I want to answer to that and then Alderdorf and then Alder Gerlach. Um, I believe this is informational and should remain informational because let's say at this committee here, like Alder Weary said, he wanted uh, uh, us to take the policy where we just don't tell the soccer teams or any team uh, that they need to follow certain rules that we just open it up to them. And I disagree with that, but we have that debate and let's just say uh, as a committee, we decide that that's not a good idea and we vote it down. Does that mean that all the weary then cannot take that idea to staff and to the mayor? No, he can. So it really doesn't matter what kind of action we would take as a committee or as a council, any input we have, we wanna make, we can still do that no matter what every, everybody, everybody else thinks about it. So it really doesn't matter. We're not gonna be able to take any action. We cannot force the mayor to do something that's it's in his purview. It's a, this is it's the executive's yeah. job to run the city and we can make recommendations yeah. we can you neutered us so we can't do anything you are the order sir wait till you're called on we'll go to you door us, Durlach, and then you when you're you in that order, us, so. you have nothing to say right now wait your turn i call alder the vote dwarf. receive a place on alder file dwarf. alder dwarf i'm calling the vote randy receive a place on file Oh, you're asking the question? Okay, I didn't hear you say that. I'm sorry. My apology. Yep. I said we should the question. Receive a place on no file. All the more. There, well, I, I, I don't think that's right. Point of order. You need to hear another point of view. We've got to hear two of the same points of view. Well, I would like a chance to talk. This isn't my item. Alder Burnett took far this more than his item. five minutes. Well, I, I would I, like a chance to on. talk. If, if I may. This is information. There's nothing to talk about. We can't do anything. Right. It's information. Randy neutered us. We can't do anything. You can't do anything, even if it wasn't. So yes, we could have. It's, we it's up you for discussion. It. There's no action to take. There's no question to ask. Alder Dorf. Thank you. First of all, I would like to commend the Parks Department for remembering that we are in the middle of a pandemic. It seems that that notion has been forgotten by a few people. The Parks Department seems to be wanting to keep our public as safe as humanly possible, in addition to our staff and other employees. We are still in a pandemic. We do not know what's going to happen. There are certainly differences of, of opinion on this council. I myself will wear a mask. I will not engage in high risk activities. Other council members feel differently, obviously, and do those and do other things. Our job, I believe, as city council is to govern, governance. The city's job is to manage. We cannot continue to keep trying to micromanage in all of these committees. We're micromanaging what we've hired our employees to do. I assume they're looking at CDC guidelines. I assume they've been consulting with the health department. I assume that they're looking up so we don't have an emergency order in right now in Wisconsin, but turning the dial, not just opening the floodgates. People are dying every day. If you did not see it today in the news, we have reached a record number in Wisconsin in the last two days. 
Look at the pandemic news that's going on. Thank you, Director Ditchite. Thank you, Parks Department, for caring about our children and our families and trying to keep our parks and pools safe for them. And I strongly support everything that you're doing. Thank you. You're muted. Oh, like. um, I guess Alderdorf pretty much said everything I wanted to say. I, I maybe will just add that as the oldest person in the room, um, I have never lived through a pandemic before. Um, I've had a lot of accomplishments and successes in my life, but none of them have been in the area of parks and recreation. I have children and grandchildren who've played every sport, but I'm not an expert at all in any of those areas. And I would like to say that I have complete faith in our parks and rec and forestry department. I think that's why we hire professional staff I don't think we have to question everything they do. I appreciate their dedication to keeping our citizens safe. I have read the entire document before the meeting, and I saw all the references to the CDC and all of the other proper guidelines and, and authorities. And um, I just like to note that the staff put a lot of work into this. I trust them. And I'd also like to note that we have a young mother on our staff who is sitting there at past 7.30 at night holding a baby while we talk about these things. And um, I think we, we owe her some respect and some, some thanks. I make a motion to open the floor to hear from interested parties. I see a lot of people are signed into the meeting. Okay, well, uh, first I did uh, offer all our uh, weary the chance to speak unless it was just to call a question. If there's anything else you care to add right now, Alder Weary, or? Should we open the floor? No. Well, I think we still got a quorum. Uh, motion open the floor by Alder Burnett. Is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, second by Alder Gerlach. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Is there anyone here who would care to speak on this item? I am not. We have to ask three times. I don't, is that really official? Is that <laughs> I, I've never. <laughs> I got to click my heels three times. <laughs> Hi, Randy. Randy, it's uh, Pat B with the Park and Rec. Oh, okay. Uh, please state your well. You say your name. What's your address? What well, with your Park and Rec, your staff. You can just yeah. I'm recreation yeah. supervisor. Okay, yep. Yep. Certainly. Just like to address uh, the soccer leagues. Um, I talked to the leaders of Green Bay Lightning, Green Bay Strikers, Green Bay Kickers, you know, for the last two months and talked through the whole process with them. The decision came from their boards. The Green Bay Strikers group that oversees the Strikers, along with SAY, made that decision. They said due to, this is a strikers talking, they said due to safety, well-being of players, referees and volunteers, that they decided not to continue the program for the safety of those people. Also Green Bay Lightning, I talked to Tom Mole, um, their overseeing body made that decision. So it's not uh, Green Bay Park and Rec or City of Green Bay telling them that they cannot play their board made that decision. The Green Bay Kickers, they talked to them. They, um, they're under Bay Lakes and SAY. And, and they also, with the health and safety of their kids, their children and spectators, they're looking in and do programming for their seniors to give them an opportunity. So just to talk about the soccer groups, we deal with them and listen to them and have been talking to them throughout the last two months and the decision came from their governing bodies. Oh, I, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, do you think, think in those discussions, do you think the city's guidelines influenced them to cancel? No, 
Thank you. Um, I think that they're looking, some of the people work in the medical fields and they're seeing um, the number of COVID cases in the Green Bay community and they feel strongly that we need to look out for those children. And they had no problem with when I was saying um, that right now CDC guidelines are saying 10 people are under. They were, you know, that we're following those guidelines that close and that was their decision. Thank you. Alderman Scandal? Uh, yes, Tony. Tony Freeman with the uh, Green Bay Blue Ribbons. Uh, uh, could you please state your name and address? Tony Freeman. I'm in De Pere, 4084 Half Crown Run in De Pere, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Speaking on behalf of the uh, uh, Green Bay Blue Rib Ribbons, the uh, De Pere Dodgers Baseball Club, uh, doing business as the, the Blue Ribbons, uh, playing at Joanne's. So I, I appreciate getting called out as a as a separate group. Um, um, maybe I maybe I appreciate that. I'm not sure, but uh, we do kind of fill a niche that we're not uh, youth baseball, um, and we're not also uh, city organized adult league either. Um, it's it's interesting. It's uh, just like everyone else. This is an untimely event. We actually have uh, 40 players this year that were interested in playing for the Blue Ribbons. Wow. Um, we were playing in two leagues, not only the 50-year-old Wisconsin State League, but also the, the new BL, uh, along with the Green Bay Storm, Appleton, and Menasha, some of the other local teams. Um, so we had a pretty aggressive schedule set up. Um, you know, our mission changed a little bit last year with our decision to move back to Joannie's. And we took on a focus, um, you know, based on um, desires of the city and, and Mayor Gingrich and the Parks and Recreation to focus on that Joannie's committee, or community rather, uh, the communities in and around, the neighborhoods in and around Joannie's. Uh, and that I think is, is one of the frustrating parts of this for us. Our mission is to provide entertainment to those people. That is the number one mission statement in our, in our organization, but we're unable to to do that. At the same time, I have 38 players. We actually have 40. I have two two players from Japan uh, that wanted to play. Um, but with half the season gone, it's very difficult to offer them the challenge that they're looking for in baseball. A lot of these guys are college players. Most of our most of the Blue Ribbons are, are college players. Div three, Div two, uh, some of them straight out of high school. Uh, we don't compete directly with the Booya for the for the Div One players, uh, but we do draw all of our players from the you know from the immediate vicinity from Northeast Wisconsin. So I've got a bunch of players that we're looking to provide that entertainment at Joannie's. We have a uh, you know it's our own insurance, our own board. We play within the leagues. We have to follow the league rules as well. Uh, both of our leagues have come back and said it's going to be up to the to the teams to set. Uh, some level of structure uh, at the at their particular home stadium, whether that's every team has to provide their own baseball ball, their own balls, their own gear, no water, whatever. Um, so each of the leagues doing that individually. Uh, we're all working with all the different cities and all the different municipalities and all the different counties and trying to figure out what that looks like. Uh, there must be 40 teams involved in the two leagues. Now, not that many. 25 teams in the two leagues. And, and we've We've got every recommendation out there from you have to cancel to, uh, you know, no sure, just go ahead with everything that you're doing. And then you factor in insurance and legal opinion and it, it gets even more complex. So while we're, while we're okay with doing that, uh, with, with providing that C plan, um, the challenge we have is that it doesn't address our mission. Our mission is to have people at Joannie's to provide that very low cost entertainment for the people in and around that can walk to Joannie's. And, uh, you know, if we have a 50 person limit and we have to count the players, staff and uh, umpires, there's no room for any guests. There's no room for any of, of the locals to come in. Uh, if we only count the locals, you know, that's probably, uh, that was probably our average attendance last year. Uh, that would include the parents and friends of the players. Um, so, you know, we, we would, I think our approach and what I've talked to James about 
would be that 50 person limit would be applied to the fans and not the players. Our insurance is set up that is sort of differentiates the two. We would be able to look at the players as us almost employees. Not they're not really, but the players, the umpire person, the staff there's, but they're, they're part of the organization and, and therefore they're, they're like the employees at McDonald's. They don't count to that 50 person limit or home Depot. They don't count to that 50 person limit or that occupancy limit. We're arguing, I guess that they don't. That would at least allow us to have that average occupancy back. And then we only have to deal with the fact that we lose half the season. Financially, it's a real struggle. You know, we, we make about a third of our money. Revenue comes from the fans coming in and concession sales. Obviously we're going to limit our concession sales to prepackaged. We won't do the draft beer. We'll, we'll do prepackaged food, obviously bottled, bottled water and soda. But then the third part of our, our revenue comes from sponsorships, from going out and talking to businesses, which has also been suspended this year. So it has been, it has been a challenge. We can definitely put the plan together. I don't believe that we will be all the CDC guidelines. I don't think it will. Again, we're going to address the number of people. We're not going to count the staff and the players. Most of them are on the field anyway, and they're physically separated from the, from the fans. But then there are just some other limits that we have from a, from a volunteer and a staffing standpoint, we're unable to sanitize the stands. There's just no way, you know, if we have 50 people in the stands, we can't sanitize. We just don't have the bodies. It's an all volunteer organization. There's nine of us on the board. Three of us are, are trying to keep this thing up and running, you know, and at every game, three or four of us at every game, the staff is minimal because it's, you know, it's money that we don't have. Every nickel that we save, we put back to the, you know, to the, to the fans. And then, you know, I don't know if any of you know, but our, our, our third part of our mission statement says that we use volunteer groups and pay them a part of our gate. So obviously without, without that, with that loss of revenue, we don't have that incentive to get those volunteers in other than the fact they just want to come out for a good night of baseball. Anyway, that was my point. We'll definitely follow this. We're going to have to file the safety plan to play in the league play anyway. There's going to be some cancellations. There already have been, we've got teams in Illinois that aren't going to be able to come up that aren't able to travel. They may have to cancel their seasons, even if the leagues don't, it's still in flux. We'll just do the best we can with it and, and hope it works out. You know, that's, that's our status, I guess. And well, I'm certainly wish you the best. I mean, this pandemic is, is tough. I certainly wish you the best and I'm sure staff will do what they can to, to help facilitate you, but you know, I just wish you the best. I don't know if staff has anything they care to add to that. No, I mean, James is working fairly closely with this group and we'll continue to do so to, you know, do the best we can to put together a plan and make sure everyone's as safe as possible. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you guys. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Anyone else? Take a motion to close the floor. Uh, motion by Alder Burnett. Second. Second by Alder Gerlach. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the floor is now closed. Uh, is there anything else from anyone else? Okay, I, I just want to reiterate that I think uh, Alder input and community input is welcomed and and sought, I'm sure, by the mayor's office and by staff, but we have no, other than making suggestions, uh, I don't see how we can do any actionable item, uh, any take any action of any sort. So uh, with that, let us, uh, let me get back to my agenda. Uh, Alder Scannell. Yep, Alder the Faith. Um, can I ask a question before you uh, are done? And, and again, I apologize. <laughs> I really had trouble. My computer, I couldn't get the uh, 
the numbers to put in, you know, for the password and all that. So I couldn't get in, okay. and I didn't know who to who I could call. So I apologize for that. But I would just want to know what did you decide on number three? Oh, uh, well, can I tell you? I can inform you on that. You know, when we're all done here, quick. When we we got a break in between, why don't we just finish up our business here, and I can let you know. Okay, because I might. I think I'm going to pull it at the council because. You know, I apologize again. I did not get to speak on it, so it's not it's uh, not well, your we, fault or anything. I believe it's it's the committee, it's mine. If I remember, if I remember right, we're, we sent it to staff to do a breakdown of costs, and uh, that's where it's at. It's, it's referred back to staff to do, get, do a breakdown of all the different costs for all the different projects. Okay, you're right. That's what I wanted to know on that, and then I did want to make a suggestion that we return the money and pay off the bond that portions to save interest we have to save wherever we can mm. you know these are projects that these are wish projects so that's fine yep okay thank you yep all right uh uh need to receive this in place on file or do we just keep going on informational i think you need to receive in place on file any motion yep by Alder Gerlach. Yes, I move that we re re receive in place on file. Okay. Second. I'll second it. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. No. So it's not received and placed on file. It fails two to two. So we move on. And so we got number two. The two no's were Weary and Burnett? Yes. Is, is Weary on the call? I don't see him. Yeah, I believe all the Weary voted. Yes, all the Weary? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Thought I heard him. So I don't, I, I don't know. I'll have to get clarification. I, I'm really just spitballing here. But uh -huh. can you really deny an informational item? I don't know if that well, really... it's to receive in place on file. So I don't know what happens when we vote not to receive in place. I, I wish uh, <laughs> uh, I have to, so I'll here. I don't know. I'll have to reach out to our attorney uh, and clarify how that actually works. I, I don't know how that works. Yeah, I, I have no clue either. I mean, I uh, if it's not received in place on file, what it, it just I, I think it's orbiting the earth right now, and we'll just. Leave it there for them until Vanessa can pick it up. Uh, so let's move on to informational item two, director's report, updates, and recent activities of the Parks, Recreation, and Forestry Department. Yeah, at this point, I really don't have a lot to add uh, uh, to it. I know that it's pretty comprehensive list in our debate report. If anybody has any specific questions, you're, I'm welcome, you know, I'll, I'll answer them accordingly, so. No, I, I, I appreciate your report. They're wonderful. <laughs> very detailed, very uh, appreciated. I have no questions. Anyone else? Uh, I'll take a motion to receive and place this on file. So moved. Is there a second on that? Burnett. Uh, a motion by Alder Gerlach and seconded by Alder Burnett. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that's received in place on file. Uh, our next meeting will be at uh, June 10th, 5 o'clock. Uh, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. Could I please ask a question before oh, we Certainly, adjourn? yep. I'd like to ask Alder Weary, at what point will we reconvene for our INS meeting? Uh, it usually just takes them a couple minutes to set up. Why don't we say 8 It's 8 o'clock right now. Let's give it five minutes. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Someone? Ooh. So moved by Alder Burnett. Second. Okay. Second by Alder Weary. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.